landing at two o'clock and we'll be here shortly. So we'll jump right into item number three with the impact fees 101 uh, with Fred Philpot, the consultant, Mike Ackerlo, the director of hand. Good afternoon. Thanks for being here, Mike. You're welcome. While Fred's getting set up, let me just uh, introduce this quickly. Uh, as you know, uh, Fred has been working on the city's impact fee plan for a little while. Uh, we are currently working with the mayor's office on her final recommendations before that is sent to the council. Uh, he's going to give you a bit of a 101 for some council members who are new and uh, for those of you who aren't a review on impact fees, but also a bit of a preview of what the new plan will include. Um, the level of service, perhaps some of the um, projects that, that are being proposed. Um, the uh, new uh, impact fee facility plan will, once it comes to you, it's your, you can review it, um, add projects, whatever you decide to do, change those fees. Um, and once it's adopted, those fees will go into place after a 90 day wait period. Um, if they're increased, any de decrease in fees can become effective immediately. I think, um, I think that's about it. I, I'm really pleased with this new plan. I think we've, we have, uh, Fred has worked with the administration closely, the experts in transportation and engineering, in police and fire to make sure that we're using um, a comprehensive methodology that uh, we believe is, is, is really uh, good for this plan and moving forward with the needs in our city. So um, I'm trying to stretch this out a little bit. <laughs> Mike, yes. while we're waiting, if there are questions for you specifically, are you open to entertaining sure. some questions? Sure. Great. Stan. Can we ask you some hard questions? Um, okay. If I have the option to decline. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think you have that option, actually. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Check with Margaret, but I don't think you do, actually. Um, a couple things, Mike. Um, we. Uh, this has been a long process, and so uh, one of the challenges with impact fees is that we um, get a lot of uh, confusion, I think, in the general public about it, and, and particularly from developers about what's going on, what they're for, how do we use them. One of our challenges uh, historically has been um, anticipating our need and, and really mm -hmm. leveraging the match for impact fees right. so that we actually spend them in a, in a timely and reasonable fashion on our priorities. Um, as part of this plan, um, how have we addressed those uh, issues and concerns? How, how, have we done, how have we communicated out with the public, general public and developers? How have we looked at shifting the way we consider impact fees so that we are uh, better prepared to accurately assess them and expend them, and how are we looking at coordinating uh, the leverage uh, when we have match requirements? Great. Um, let me talk, tackle the first one, which is outreach and working with the stakeholders and developers, uh, developer community. Uh, we will be doing that. We haven't done it yet. This is the first preview to the plan. We are putting together some community meetings, development of, uh, forums, items like that to make sure that we get as much outreach as we can get. Um, we can look at Open City Hall. There's a number of resources. Once uh, council gets involved, there are also public hearings. Uh, I think the last plan, there was not, um, we didn't do as good of a job as we could have on that outreach, and we'll make sure we do that this time. We want to make sure that people understand the plan and make their comments so that uh, as, as you make your decisions, you have that information as well. Um, in terms of the uh, looking at how the leverage is used and making sure that we can reasonably uh, accomplish this plan, I think Fred's done a really good job on that and is going to show you that today. Uh, we, there's different ways to look at this. You can say, yes, we want everything under the sun and we'll just figure out a way to, to finance it, but the reality is it's, that's not going to happen. Um, so Fred has done a really good job on identifying those needs, showing what uh, the impact fee eligibility is, 
and then what the other funding sources that we required. As we worked with the different departments and divisions, we made that clear and we said, you, you know, we've got to be able to fund these projects. And so don't come w with a huge list of things that we're not going to be able to do. So I think we've gotten a good plan together that we could accomplish over the next 10 years. And um, you might not be uh, prepared right now, Mike, to, to address this, but it, uh, it occurs to me that one of the real challenges we have is that um, impact fees are spread across many departments and divisions, um, but we sort of hold uh, CED responsible for impact fees. And one of the challenges, and I'll use parks as an example, is that there traditionally hasn't been a really um, adequate relationship with parks and impact fees and how they they tend to develop their priorities independently of information around impact fees. Do, have you gone so far as to look at how you might structurally change that going forward? And I, and I recognize it is a challenge um, where you, you know, are lateral uh, and also not necessarily attached, nor, nor am I suggesting you personally should be attached to the budget process and other departments or divisions, but how do we structurally mm -hmm. address um, how to encourage um, the eligible yeah. projects in other areas of the city? The first thing I would say is impact fees are complex. They're hard to understand and um, it, we've had a number of discussions with people in different departments you know, I'm not sure, saying I'm not really sure what I can use my impact fees for, and is this eligible or is this not eligible? So what we've really tried to do out of the shoot with this plan is include all those people so that they're very aware of what, what uh, their impact fees can be used for and um, the amount or the percentage of eligibility. So that's been, we've, uh, right from the beginning, we've been working with them. Going forward, Holly Draney in my office has set up a fantastic way of monitoring these fees, how they're being spent and working with the different departments and divisions to make sure that they know what those fees can be used for and that they're included on their CIP applications. So this year as we go through CIP, one of the things that we did when we received the applications, we reviewed all of those and made sure that any project that was impact fee eligible included that percentage on their application. So it is, it's still working with them, but I do believe we are trying to be more proactive and making sure they understand what they can use them for. And so I, I assume we're gonna do some follow up um, uh, since this is our first look at this in the year. Um, but one of the things I would be really interested in going forward is that I, I appreciate that you've incorporated that into the CIP um, process, which you manage out of your division, but how do we do it even before it gets into the CIP process? How do we help departments ensure that their priorities are making it into the CIP process uh, as, re as they relate to eligibility for impact fees. I think first of all, it's making sure they're aware of what they can use them for. So as they're planning, they already know what's impact fee eligible and what's not. Second, it is, it's, it's an issue of being proactive in, in our division and making sure that as they are planning, we're at the table. And I think actually we've had some success with that recently. Uh, we've done a lot more outreach and we're meeting more on how these fees can be used with the different departments and divisions and I, I think we're making a lot of headway with that. It is a proactive approach and we're on that and, and working hard. Charlie. Um, so I appreciate the way that you just phrased that it's a proactive approach because I think one of the concerns that I've had for a long time is that the impact fees, the way that we handle them as a city is anything but proactive. Um, we have fees that'll come in, um, but there's still a lot of uncertainty as to how, to how they could be spent, where they should be spent. And I think what's, you know, some of Stan's points were uh, the, he was bringing up the importance of collaboration between departments uh, is really important because without that collaboration, without having uh, those discussions and ensuring that all departments are on the same page, regarding the impact fees that are coming into the city, it's gonna be really, it's, it, well, it's, it's very difficult to spend those impact fees the way that we can be spending them. I know that there are a lot of restrictions um, from the state on how to do them, but, but we can figure that stuff out. We just have to do that. And that, so I, I am appreciative of this process of you know, going through this and I really hope that uh, the study is more than just looking at how those fees can be spent, but really developing a strong framework of 
uh, reporting and communication between those departments so that everyone's on the same page. Because the other issue uh, that has come up, and, and I think especially as this process has moved forward, there is a lot of misunderstanding about what impact fees are, what they can be used for. There's a lot of assumptions that, you know, because uh, uh, housing development is going in in Sugar House that 21st South should be, <coughs> uh, you know, repaved or whatever else that we legally can't use impact fees for those kind of things. So, um, but I think part of the, one of the problems with the disconnect that we've had that, that it, hopefully we can get past is that we haven't been able to communicate effectively to our residents, uh, to business owners, to the developers that are being assessed those fees, uh, and even everybody else in the city, whether you know, you're in a different department or us on the council. So hopefully that, that reporting will uh, be much more robust, robust as this moves forward. So Agreed, and, and I think part of what's added to the confusion is over the last couple of years with the current plan, we've had some bumps along the way. We had to, we had the ordinance that didn't allow for citywide transportation fees to be collected. It was, there was a, a discrepancy in the ordinance, so we had to change that, and then that I think led to some confusion, and then we had the decrease in the parks fee. So I agree with you, I think people aren't entirely clear what we're doing with the fees and how they can be used. I think this new plan will be helpful. I think it's important also that the community and policy uh, makers and leaders of the city understand that the plan is what guides us on how we can use those impact fees. And, and so that's our, that's really the document we can rely on to fund our projects. And I think there still is some confusion about whether a project can be impact fee eligible um, or not. And so hopefully this plan will clear that up. Erin. Uh, Thanks. Um, beginning with the reality that you started with, that this is really complicated and that um, there isn't a quick set of criteria that tell you whether or not something is impact fee eligible, just play along with me okay. for a moment. That I wonder if, there, if we couldn't benefit from creating an impact fee use review team sort of entity that had the the dynamic ability of a team mentality to look at projects um, and pretend that there is an easy criteria that they could get them through. The, uh, the, the, the beauty of a team approach to looking at possible projects is um, for when you have more than one brain on it and the difficulty of training every employee whose hands from parks or from other departments is cross-departmental departmental approach that would require us to train all of our employees to know how impact fees can be used is, that's a, that's a big task right there. And I like the team approach because of, I think anytime you get a lot of minds around uh, a possibility, we end up with a better product, but also there's fewer people to train. Um, but that they could look at the objective of the project and see fairly quickly whether or not it would satisfy the basic um, requirements of impact fees. If it does, or if a, some variation of it would, then maybe it's worth that team taking on. And um, in two parts, it could, their review could either result in expediting this to CIP, in the CIP process so that it can go through all of the channels necessary in the amount of time that those funds are alive, essentially. As slow as we move around here, years mm -hmm. is really fast. And um, if projects don't get that kind of momentum boost, then they can obviously not happen before we've had a chance to spend the money. So a team, some kind of a team approach might be able to help us um, give that momentum to mm -hmm. the projects that can make the best use of the dollars. And then additionally, that team could um, be the reporting mechanism to our developers who are contributing to that fund and our taxpayers who want to know that their resources are secure as our city grows. Um, so uh, to my peers and maybe for you to respond to, Mike, what do you think about that kind of approach instead of having to train all of our departments when it's already been hard enough to train this body of seven on what impact <laughs> fees can be used for? Yeah. I think it's a great approach. Uh, this, this process has been much different than I think the last one than the process that we've done the last one in that it has been much more collaborative. Uh, Fred has worked directly with divisions and departments 
on their needs and, and their level of service and their data and everything. So it's been much more collaborative to start with. The other thing I would mention is uh, Melissa Jensen from my office is working on the implementation strategy. If you remember, uh, a, a, this position was funded a year ago to work on implementing master plans, the consolidated plan and so forth, and so much of that is aligning resources. So that would include impact fees, CIP, et cetera. And so when, when we look at these projects and we meet with this team, which includes, Melissa is including a member from each division department, and we talk about the projects going forward, that impact fee eligibility is certainly a part of that. And we can then move forward on those projects and making sure that they ask for the impact fees. But I think Council Member Mendenhall, you're also asking for a step beyond that and just making sure that everybody understands uh, the plan, what the eligibility requirements are, what's in the plan and what they can do, and then have that team meet on a regular basis to make sure that we're, we're including those items or that they're, as they do their planning, they, they have that understanding of impact fees if I'm correct. Beyond master plans. Exactly, beyond master plans. I think it's a, it's a holistic approach and I think it's a great idea and something we can do. Okay, thank you. All right, let's see this wonderful presentation. <laughs> Alrighty, uh, so yeah, I was uh, asked to come uh, provide the Impact Fees 101 again since we've had some new faces uh, join the council. So I'm gonna review uh, the kind of the background of the impact fees, what is required, uh, what we include in our analysis, and also provide some details with regards to the specific uh, facilities that we're looking at and capital improvement plans that I've received. If I move too quickly, you can slow me down, ask questions um, as I move through these slides. So this process uh, began a, a, a little while ago. Uh, the last time I was in front of you was September to go over this. Um, but the, the process requires that we complete an impact fee facilities plan and an impact fee analysis, and then the city adopts the impact fee schedule through an ordinance uh, that illustrates the proposed uh, and uh, adopted impact fees. The impact fee facilities plan identifies the planning level uh, information that is included in, in the analysis, and the impact fee analysis side uh, completes the proportionate share or in essence divides all of the costs among, amongst the demand units that we're looking at for each of the specific utilities or uh, facilities. So within this process, we typically follow these major steps here. We look at the service area and, and complete a demand analysis specific to each of the uh, components that we're looking at. We have to evaluate levels of service then look at ex the existing facilities and determine if there's any excess capacity that we want to include in the calculation of the impact fee. Where there isn't sufficient excess capacity or uh, capacity within your existing infrastructure, that would trigger new facilities. And those new, new facilities are evaluated to, to determine how much of those facilities can be included in the impact fee analysis. And then we have to look at the financing strategy uh, of both your existing facilities, how you funded those facilities, and the proposed financing strategy for the future facilities. Uh, why that's important is we have to remove any funding or facilities that have been funded by uh, mechanisms other than your existing residents. So let's say if you received grants to fund facilities or other agencies provided funds. Uh, we where we can identify that, we remove that value. If, uh, when we look at future facility, facilities, if we need to issue bonds, for example, then we can include that associated interest cost or cost of issuance and bring that into the total cost of the facility that we're planning on constructing. So those, uh, that, that step applies to both your ex excess capacity or, or existing facilities as well as the future facilities that we're looking at. So our uh, analysis is assuming that we look at a citywide service area uh, and that the services that are being provided uh, are being provided across the city um, and we're not looking at uh, separating out any service areas within, uh, within the city. As we look at demand uh, for the components that we've evaluated, we're looking at calls for service and that's police and, public, uh, police and fire calls for service. We're looking at trip counts for uh, transportation, and we're looking at population growth uh, as it relates to parks and recreation improvements. The analysis uh, we have to go through is to determine what the existing footprint or demand looks like, and then determine 
uh, assumptions with regards to future growth within the community. It's important to note that the IFFP planning horizon, the impact fee facilities plan planning horizon, uh, is really focusing on a six to 10 year window. Uh, and that's tied to the requirement that you have to expend your impact fees within six years from the date at which they're collected. So we look at a rolling window and project that out a couple years beyond that, that six years, which is the essence of that 10 year window. But if we get beyond that, then those assumptions become less and less accurate as you try to look farther and farther out. Great. Can I just ask you to clarify on the expenditure with si within six years? Does uh, a financial commitment in a project count? Or, I mean, is it literally expending the funds and dispersing them? So the impact fees can be encumbered within that time, and there's a specific definition with regards to encumbrance, which means it has to be... Uh, dedicated to the repayment of a debt service payment or there has to be a purchase order associated with that. So as long as it's encumbered in that manner, then you can extend that window. So I'm gonna jump into some details with regards to each of these uh, steps as I've identified. Again, if there are specific questions in each of these components, just chime in and I'll do the best I can to answer those. Uh, a, a key component in the impact fee facilities plan is determining level of service. And the statute doesn't uh, stipulate how that's to be done necessarily for each facility. It just indicates that we have to do that. What it does uh, tell us is that we have to identify an existing level of service. We have to identify a proposed level of service. And our proposed level of service cannot exceed that existing level of service through the collection of impact fees. So we can increase our level of service by identifying other funding mechanisms, uh, but impact fees cannot be used to raise the level of service or cure a deficiency within your system. New development can only be charged for that, maintaining that level of service uh, through impact fees moving forward. So when we look at the specific components, um, I've provided a, a brief summary of the level of service variables that we've looked at for pi parks, fire, police, and transportation. For parks, we look at the total investment that has been made within the community as it relates to parks and public land, as well as the improvement value on that uh, park and public land acreage. And based on the inventory that we've collected and the valuation of that inventory, we've come up with a total of, uh, value of $1,553 per capita. Uh, so based on your existing population and, and the existing uh, parks and public lands, that's the investment value that you've uh, currently provided to residents. Uh, it's important to note that this value includes an assumption with regards to land values uh, as well as that improvement value. In addition, we've stripped out any uh, park acreage that has been provided by, again, those other funding mechanisms, whether that was grant uh, funding other agencies or donated land, which typically can happen within the uh, park services. When you look at fire, uh, we typically look at these square footage that you currently provide within your buildings uh, and also look at response time um, because there's really two components. It's size of the facilities themselves and geographic location that determines how you locate fire stations. So based on your existing station, uh, square footage, you have 1.61 square feet per call that uh, is received by the fire department and 1.44 non-station square feet, would, which would be training facilities and those types of facilities, uh, and that's also per call. The response time is 3.81 minutes uh, on average for the fires with imminent life threat. So the capital facility facilities plan is designed to maintain those level of levels of service variables, specifically as it relates to response time and ensuring that the fire department can get to fires in an appropriate time. Similarly with police, we look at the uh, facility square footage on a per officer basis and look at the number of officers per 1,000 calls. And as we evaluate the future facilities, we determine if we're exceeding that level of service or if we're uh, adopting a facility plan that is um, perpetuating it or potentially even reducing that level of service based on uh, that plan. And then as we look at transportation, across your roadways, we're looking at maintaining a level of service C. 
Uh, it's important to note that, again, Salt Lake City is unique, serving as a regional center for a lot of the Wasatch Front and the state, uh, which requires you to focus on multimodal um, transportation improvements and not just specifically expansion to your roadways, but in order to handle trips on your roadways, whether those are, are vehicle trips, pedestrian trips, or transit trips, we have to look at facilities that will ensure that you continue to maintain that level of service C. And so, Fred, that the uh, and one of the distinctions there in transportation, if I'm understanding this correctly, is we don't do a per capita or a per call sort of that similar uh, kind of comparison because we're providing a level of service at an intersection, uh, and that's not always determined by our residents. Correct, but we do look at trip counts, uh, whether those are vehicle trips, pedestrian trips. Um, or uh, non-vehicular trips. Per capita? Uh, no, so that's just across the city, um, but, but we can project those based on uh, resident, uh, residential development or the various commercial types of development and determine a ratio of impact based on those trip counts. So that would uh, uh, be a significant evaluation in a high density uh, situation for apartments or condos or something like that, but it, but it's across the board. Is Correct. Right. Okay. Yeah. So it looks at the impact of all of the different development types within the community, and and it can get very detailed. Or in this case, uh, the the evaluations that we're looking at are perpetuating your existing schedule. Looks at at residential uses and general commercial development, industrial development, or office. Uh, office type development. So one additional question related to transportation, that evaluation of a grade C is a, is a vehicle evaluation. How do you incorporate pedestrian issues into well, that? Well, that level of service C is actually an evaluation of the road itself, not necessarily vehicles on the roadway. It's, it's determining how much congestion that is, and in order to maintain that, you, Salt Lake City will have to provide uh, several types of improvements, whether that's signalization, uh, bike uh, improvements that allow the roadways and all of the transportation infrastructure to, ma to maintain that level of service C. So it's, it's not necessarily vehicular, it's the congestion, the cumulative congestion on the roadways and your transit si or your and, transportation system. And so system. Fred, I'm just a little concerned, and maybe Mike, you could jump here too if you have additional information, or maybe we might want to follow up with engineering later. But I'm a little concerned that we may be using an evaluation that's traditionally driven um, modifications for congestion around vehicles. And I'm concerned about what that looks like when you start overlaying complete streets and bikes and, and pedestrians on that. And so I just want to throw a caution flag up there around that. And if you, and Fred, if you feel like that is appropriate um, going forward, um, uh, I, I would like a little more information about how we can be confident that we don't end up with a a vehicle-based improvement, uh, congestion improvement program that, that disregards those other forms of transit. Yeah, so um, transportation provided some, uh, solicited some additional input from uh, an outside consultant, Farron Pierce, with regards to those trip demands within the system and, and the impacts that we'll have. So that, that information will be included in the, in the document to show that um, the impact of the multimodal trips within your system, specific to your system. One, one more qu quick question on that. You're saying that those uh, multimodal transportation options are considered in the assessment of congestion, but you're not saying that those multimodal options are, uh, oper that they have impact the access for future expansion? No, that they both are considered. So the, the demand is considered as well as the impact on your infrastructure and what improvements would be necessary to maintain, continue to maintain a level of service C throughout your system. I guess what I'm asking is, are alternative modes of transportation impact the eligible? Yes, that's what we're looking at. So the signalization uh, and uh, trailway design. So there's a multimodal improvements that are considered in the capital improvement plan. Great. And I'm sorry, one more <laughs> question, yeah. for, but I think, I think I've got this. So if we're looking at a system-wide evaluation of C 
level. How, how does a um, lower grade in a particular in intersection influence that? And if we are able to divert people from vehicles to another mode, what I think I'm hearing you say is that may be eligible for impact fees if we can reduce congestion based on diverting trips in that intersection. Correct. Okay. And th this is really an average across your system. There will be some areas that are deficient and some areas that actually have a higher level of service, but we're looking across the system to determine an average. If it's deficient, that, that would not be impact fee eligible. You, you have to bring that up to the level of service by some other mechanism where it's, uh, w where it's exceeding this, and that's where there's some excess capacity that allows for that uh, intersection to continue to service new growth. So what about maintaining it at a sea level? I mean, if we're looking at a goal to maintain it and do that, we need to reduce vehicle trips. Does that allow us to use, consider impact fees for those diversions? Yeah, so as long as it's based on that, okay. we're managing new trips within our system, that's the key connection, is that the improvement has to manage additional trips and not provide improvement to an existing roadway that's maintaining uh, existing levels of service for existing trips Got and it. not handling new growth. That, that is a key delineation in the impact fee process is are we adding capacity within our system by making this improvement? And if we can answer that question, then we can go farther down that road of determining, it, determining if that's impact fee eligible. You, su you suggested bikes, you suggested pedestrians. What about transit? Yeah, so we've uh, looked at some of those variables. Um, the, the plan hasn't been completely finalized, but that will be delineated in the final CIP list and uh, impact fee facilities plan. Andrew. Question about level of service then. How are those set? Because I, I've never heard any way about how they ever increase. I'm assuming they increase at some point. But if they're set independently, how does that happen? Or if they're set locally to us, how does that happen? Yeah, so typically we look at a local assessment and determining what is the actual congestion mm -hmm. on your roadways. And this is just a metric to evaluate where that is on a scale, mm -hmm. uh, with F being your roadways are failing and it, it uh, delineates what, what sort of time delay that might be. So really this is evaluating what your current conditions are mm -hmm. and making sure that the impact fee maintains that that level of service but doesn't requirement. increase it yes. yes and and if you want to increase that you can do that but we have to identify some other way other than impact fees to do that so if you increase it by some other way and we come to the next impact fee analysis in six to ten years yeah um, does it increase at that point based on the the increase we've made in the in terms correct of if if the if you choose to do that so Again, we cannot exceed our level of service, but our proposed level of service can actually be lower than this, uh, which, which sometimes happens with regards to these plans, especially as we consider the available revenues that are uh, uh, available to fund future facilities. Uh, but if you were to increase your level of service by some other mechanism and then reevaluate the IFFP, then yes, we could push that up and show what the revised impact fee would be based on that investment that you've made. So that's true across the board. So we could go, if we wanted a, a B level <laughs> level of service, yes. we'd find other funding, increase it up in the years intervening, in the next analysis, that's a level of service, therefore the impact fees can maintain it at B. Same thing with say parks, where if you want an increase of 2,000 per, cap per capita next time, yes. if you invested outside resources, it would be increased at that point. Correct. Okay. Yeah. So then uh, the next stage, once you evaluate that level of service, we can now determine uh, if there's excess capacity potentially within the system. Um, we look at the, uh, as we evaluate excess capacity, it's important that we consider the original value of improvements. So the statute requires that if we pull in any excess capacity value, that it has to be based on what the original cost was when it was purchased. So if that was in 1970, then we have to use the investment made in 1970 and not inflate that value into today's uh, dollars. We then look at, based on that valuation, can we pull in any of that cost and include a buy-in in the impact fee fa facilities plan and impact fee analysis. It's important in this process that we delineate system improvements versus project improvements. 
uh, system improvements being those that benefit the system as a whole versus project improvements that are specific to uh, a project within that system and not necessarily beneficial to the community or service area as a whole. Uh, when we look at specifics for, again, these uh, areas that we're looking at, uh, parks is a, a little unique in that we're basing this off the level of investment again and, and determining what is currently invested within the community and ensuring that new development invests in that same uh, dollar amount. And so typically there isn't an excess capacity component calculated within parks and recreation uh, or parks and public lands. Uh, we assume that those that represents our current level of service and that we're going to expand that through the collection of impact fees. When we look at the other components, there are, uh, in some cases, the ability to bring in, uh, again, that excess capacity valuation. When we look at the value of fire facilities, uh, we've estimated the original value at 24.1 million, excluding the public safety building, uh, the fire portion of the public safety building. The 2012 study showed a total of 95.3 million. So there's a, a, quite a big difference in those two variables. The previous study used a, a replacement value, with, which put it in today's dollars, where that 24.1 represents the estimated original value or investment based on the date it was constructed. Similarly, we looked at police with a total of 8.4 million of existing facility value, excluding the public safety building. And that uh, leaves uh, quite a bit less as it relates to uh, police as the majority of those facilities, um, the valuation is in that wrapped up in that public safety building. The 2012 study showed the 133 million, uh, but that included the public safety building portion uh, within that calculation, and it was also based on that replacement value. Transportation, as is typical in a lot of communities, there's substantial value associated with the infrastructure that's already been put in place on your roadways. Uh, based on the city's existing depreciation schedules, there's a total of 338 million, uh, 338.6 million in signals, street lights, bridges, roads, uh, and all the related infrastructure. The 2012 study showed it at 1.72 uh, billion, again, based on replacement value of those facilities. So we've uh, looked at those, uh, uh, that existing uh, facility value and evaluated that in the context of of this analysis and we'll be illustrating how that potentially impacts the, the analysis as, as we move forward. So uh, after you get through that demand analysis, level of service analysis, and the excess capacity, we then look at what future facilities are necessary for growth. Um, that process requires that, in essence, we go through a process of elimination and determine what is deficiency related what is repair and replacement related, and then what is increasing your level of service, and really isolating the value that's really growth-related improvements to maintain that level of service. So I have to pull out any costs that are non-impact fee eligible, uh, as well as projects that are potentially funded by other entities, uh, which can happen uh, in transportation in, in, uh, in some regards and again, isolate those impact fee eligible improvements and that's the basis for the calculation of the uh, proportionate share as we pull in those future facilities, those growth related future facilities. Again, we have to di differentiate between system improvements that benefit the whole uh, service area versus project improvements that are specific to a project. In most cases, those project improvements can be re a requirement of development and so the developer has to put those improvements in and. Other cases, um, there may be developer agreements or other ways to fund, tho fund those, but we're isolating those system improvements. And then we identify the capacity of those improvements and determine uh, how long the community will be able to um, utilize those facilities to manage new growth as it enters the service area. So uh, looking specifically at um, each of the components again, for parks and recreation, or sorry, parks and public lands. Um, based on the population growth that we're forecasting, that's a, a forecasted population growth, and the um, uh, valuation, that per capita investment, there's a potential to invest 44 million in parks and 
public lands over the next 10 years. That's an average of 4.4 million annually. Your historic spending uh, within the CIP, uh, excluding debt, has been about 2.6 million. Uh, so there is a, a difference there. But it's important to, again, remember that park impact fees are maintaining a, a level of investment. So if you have uh, a reduced population growth over time and collect less impact fee monies, that's just less investment that you will put towards the parks. But under, under that circumstance, 100% of that uh, impact fee collection would go to growth-related improvements in the parks and, and public lands uh, division. And so all of those funds should be expended if you have higher growth and that, that value could go up based on the collection of, of those impact fees over time. So under the park CIP, the assumption is that as you collect the impact fees, they uh, should be spent 100% 100% on growth related expansion to your parks and public lands facilities. So, can I ask a question, Stan? Sure. How do you differentiate between a local sort of impact project and a system wide impact project with parks, particularly? Because we don't differentiate a high growth area of Fourth South, a transit corridor, with a low growth area of established neighborhood. How does that? So really, it's it's uh, it it, it uh, is based on our definition of um, the improvements that are included, and that goes from regional parks all the way down to your open space. Uh, so really, our um, our definition and inclusion is fairly broad with regards to expanding your parks and public lands, as long as as long as that's what the impact fee is going toward is expanding that service footprint, then. Uh, you're maintaining that level of service and level of investment. Um, I think the challenge is, is if uh, this goes to that proactive approach that Mike spoke about, that is if a, if a community s invests those impact fees within a specific area and only within a specific area, it, it could over time suggest that um, we're not necessarily maintaining a level of service across our community. So you have to be proactive with regards to that investment, ensuring that uh, the improvements are benefiting the service area, which is the city as a whole, rather than a specific area within the community over time. So it, it does require that proactive approach uh, in the future. But the advantage of this approach over our previous approach is it's not project specific. It, it provides a lot more flexibility going forward about how we can use impact fees, because previously they were tied to very specific projects regardless of where they were in the city. Correct, yeah. yeah, so this allows you to maintain a level of investment because, again, parks and public lands, the, um, the desire of the community fluctuates from year to year and the types of amenities that are offered and provided, they will fluctuate over time and, and that's the challenge with the park impact fees. So this approach does do that, allows for that flexibility to make that investment. Can you speak to how you did your population growth projections? So we looked at um, historic data with regards to building permits. Uh, we looked at census data, um, uh, historic census data. We looked at the governor's office uh, projections with regards to population growth through 2020 to determine where that sat. And uh, we also received help from um, the development community with regards to their uh, development assumptions, what's in the pipeline with regards to multifamily, single family development, as well as uh, commercial development. Uh, so we, we married all of those uh, variable uh, or variety of uh, resources with regards to projections to, to make a forecast that seemed reasonable uh, with regards to growth in population and land use. So one of the reasons I ask is because we have in the last 10 years and even in the last five years seen a pretty significant shift in our growth rate. And so I'm just uh, wondering if you captured that recent trend in your projections. Yes, so we are looking at that as well as uh, shifts in the types of development that is occurring. So you've also had a shift in the type of development, the housing types that are coming within the community and, and forecasting it based on those assumptions. With that said, again, speaking back to that proactive approach, uh, they are assumptions with regards to the future, and it's likely that those assumptions will change, which requires an evaluation of the impact fee facilities plan and analysis moving forward. And if there is a substantial change, that may necessitate a revision and update to the plan itself. 
Uh, with regards to fire, uh, we've looked at a total of 26.3 million as future station capital costs with uh, approximately 3 million in training facility costs. Um, the 2012 study showed a total of 13.6 million. Um, historic spending has been about 1.2 on average per year, excluding debt. Um, so this is still tied though to the the improvements that were recommended in the previous study, which is the fire station 14 and fire station number three, relocation and expansion. Our job is again to identify what is the growth related portion of that, what is the replacement portion of that, and only include in the impact fee the expansion related cost of these recommended improvements uh, for that level of service. Uh, similarly, uh, police, we've evaluated what facilities were, would be required. Uh, we're looking at 9.8 million in new capital costs related to a sugar house precinct. Um, uh, and both public safety, uh, the fire and police, we're also evaluating the impact fee fund balance that is available to help offset that cost, so that's also included. Um, that 9.8 million that we're looking at now is similar to the 9 million that was included in the 2000, uh, 2012 study. Um, there's some slight increase as a result of the time value of money as we're projecting that into 2019 potentially. And then finally, looking at transportation, um, there was substantial costs that we're looking at with regards to transportation infrastructure across the community. You can see um, here estimated construction cost at $327 million over the next 10 years. Um, there are other funding mechanisms that are potentially available, uh, which we've identified. Um, but when you look at the city portion of that uh, at $297 million, approximately $297 million, uh, that represents a, a hefty sum of money to, to look at maintaining the system. Again, what the impact fee process requires is that we identify just the growth related portion. So of that cost, we have to strip out anything that's repair and replacement uh, or curing deficiencies within your system and only isolating what is growth related cost. And that's this last column here, which identifies approximately 41.8 million in growth related capital infrastructure. Uh, again, we also have an impact fee fund balance that is uh, available that will offset some of that growth related cost which we're also looking at in this analysis to ensure that we account for that. Uh, this, uh, I'll note that this is one area as Mike mentioned where we, we have spent a lot of time going through this plan and trying to identify just the growth related portion and ensuring that we've isolated that variable for the purposes of the impact fee. Um, and, and matching it to that level of service discussion with regards to trips. So once we've uh, completed that uh, process with regards to the demand, service area, level of service, uh, looking at excess capacity, and then what new facilities are necessary, then we have to determine what financing strategies are available. Um, that potentially could add to the cost of future facilities uh, and as I've highlighted potentially reduce some of that buy-in if we financed or funded facilities uh, by some other mechanism whether that be grants or other orga um, or organizations or uh, government entities. Uh, it's also important that uh, we identify that impact fees are a necessary variable to fund our future facilities to show that there is a growth related portion and that impact fees will be used to help maintain that level of service. So it's connecting all of those dots uh, that we've discussed and, and showing that impact fees are a necessary component within this financing strategy. Uh, when we look at, again, the specific components, uh, we assume that parks are funded through impact fees and general fund revenues. We haven't included a financing mechanism. Uh, it is typical for parks and public lands to be funded in some cases by general obligation bonds. Um, that, that requires a specific analysis as it relates to impact fees, but we haven't uh, evaluated that as of yet. Um, so we are determining that impact fees are necessary. For fire facilities, we're anticipating that there would be the use of a, uh, a bonding mechanism, a local building authority to help fund those facilities, which produces interest costs uh, to the tune of 3.5 million. So we're bringing that cost as well into the calculation of the impact fee. 
as an associated um, cost related to funding those facilities. Uh, as it relates to police and transportation, we haven't identified or included a financing mechanism s similar to fire, uh, whether that be bonding, uh, for those facilities. So we're assuming that uh, the general fund as well as impact fees collected over time would help uh, repay those monies. If that were to change over time, that, that could be an assumption that would necessitate a revision to the impact fee because that could increase the overall cost to the city with regards to those amenities. But as of now, we're, we're not assuming any additional interest costs for those improvements. Right. Um, on parks in particular, some of the challenges we've faced in providing that additional capacity or, or additional service uh, for new impact is the increasing cost of acquiring land. And, and it's something that we may not be able to accomplish in a single year. Is bonding an opportunity that we can look at from parks as well? Uh, can we bond over future revenue on impact fees, or is that something allowed within the system? Um, bonding against future impact fees is, uh, is not usually uh, the best course and, and probably not feasible because it's an uncertain revenue source. Okay. So uh, if you're looking at a multiple year funding need for acquiring sufficient property to hit some of your growth projections, what do you suggest in uh, uh, looking at that revenue stream? So, so that, that question, there's a, a lot of ways to evaluate that, but if we just look at that uh, general obligation bond, that, that can be used to help fund park-related improvements, and that has been done in the past as it relates to the city. Um, can, can, as a, 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 a connection to that, can we bond um, on general revenue and pay back the gen, uh, general fund through impact fees if we're anticipating that we're overbuilding for future growth? I mean, is that an option well, too? Well, so, no, the, the challenge with that is the Impact Fee Act requires that a credit be applied and a general obligation bond usually has an associated property tax levy that is assessed on all property, both existing and new development. So new development will be paying that general obligation through that property tax levy, and then if we turned around and assessed them an impact fee, they would in essence be paying twice for those improvements. What about, uh, what about bonding through just our general fund? Yes, so there's uh, you know al alternative bonding mechanisms like a sales tax revenue bond. Um, that uh, has different requirements, but okay. Th that financing component is, is important, and as we um, get closer to some of those realities and know for certain what that will look like, then again, that may require an update to a specific component of this analysis and determine the best way to bring that in and ensure that we are applying appropriate credits, because the Impact Fee Act requires that uh, as we consider those financing mechanisms, we ensure that we're not um, overburdening new development by making them pay twice for an improvement and when we want, want to make sure we don't do that. Uh, and, uh, and the reason I bring this up is only because of the cost of land associated with increasing parks footprint and that that uh, adding significant parcels could take multiple years of, of funding through impact fees and so there's a little bit of a challenge of balancing how, how we manage that. Correct, yeah, and, and that's definitely a challenge across communities as the price of land increases, then it becomes more and more challenging to set the impact fee at an appropriate level to maintain that, and um, it, we have to think of creative ways to address that. Uh, so in summary, once we've evaluated all of those variables, the proportionate share analysis then looks at allocating all of that uh, analysis to determine what the appropriate imp impact fee will, will be for each of these facilities. So again, we pull in that demand analysis and look at what that growth looks like within Salt Lake City, ensure that we evaluate the level of service and maintaining a, a level of service uh, through the assessment of impact fees. Then we look at that existing facility value as well as the necessary new facilities and determine the relationship between those variables. And the impact fee, if there is a buy-in component typically produces an average of those costs, you know, so we're in essence assuming that new development will pay the average of that buy-in plus the new facility across the growth that it will serve. Then we add in that financing element um, as it applies to each of those components 
and that then produces our impact fee. Now, this, this makes it very simple and, and uh, 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 easy to understand, I think, but as we've recognized, the impact fee process can be challenge, challenging and, and it does require that proactive evaluation each year. So even after this impact fee process is completed, uh, I do recommend that the impact fees are reviewed internally each year and evaluated to make sure that the assumptions are still appropriate and where they fluctuate substantially, then that may necessitate an update to this, uh, the analysis to ensure that it's reflecting current conditions. So uh, that uh, summarizes that process while providing some details with regards to where we're at and um, if there are any additional questions with regards to the impact fees or the process, we can address those. Doesn't look like it. This is the first of several conversations coming our way, I'm sure. Aaron? Stand us. I do have uh, just one uh, process related question, Mike. Um, what do you expect as the next steps and a return on this? And, and Fred, you referenced se several sort of points of additional information that we would be needing to uh, look at going forward. So I just, what's your timeline look like? We, uh, we're getting very close. Fred is working on a final draft. Um, I don't have an, you know, an estimated time that that will be ready. We do know that we've got this looming uh, suspension uh, deadline coming up, and we'd like to get this to the council as soon as we can uh, so that some, we can make some progress on this. We, um, I'm hoping within the next 10 days to have this draft ready uh, for a transmittal. So we could see it as soon as August, perhaps, mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. I don't want to be unrealistic, so. No, I'm probably, I'm I'm, no, I don't think you're being unrealistic on that at all. I think uh, my guess is by the time we get it, written and done, it'd probably be mid-August. Okay. And um, just so i pretty sure I understand, but uh, for public process too, once we adopt any increase, it's a 90-day wait period for implementation, correct? Correct. correct. Any okay. decrease in fees can immediately be adopted. Okay. Great. Thank you. And I just have a quick follow-up question. If you could go back to your, f I think it's your first or second slide that shows the map of the city. Are we looking at a sole impact fee or are we, are we going districts? I mean, what has the consultant looked at? And maybe you could give us a better description about why. We've looked at a single citywide service area. Um, so we haven't looked at establishing an impact fee based on neighborhoods or districts and that's based on um, the relationship of the facilities and, and the services that are being offered. So when you look at uh, transportation, for example, trips on your roadways and other transportation amenities are not uh, defined by a single service area. They generally cross boundaries and uh, are free to travel across your community. And the improvements are designed to uh, maintain that level of service for all of those trips um, in that travel demand model as they interact through those neighborhoods and service areas. So it's really related to that the, the, the services that are being pro provided. Similarly, fire, um, th there's a geographic response time, but those fire services are offered uh, across your community where stations respond to, to calls within different service areas and, and neighborhoods and based on the availability, availability of resources. So it's uh, establishing it based on that. In addition, it's also looking at um, ensuring that the impact fee is easy to administer and, and, and apply across that service footprint um, to manage that uh, service area. And then just a follow-up question to your response. Is that, sim I mean, is this what you would see in a municipality our size currently, is that they have a single source impact fee boundary? Um, it, it's typical in Utah to have a single citywide service area. There are some uh, amenities uh, as it relates to utilities that sometimes get pushed into a specific service area. Um, but for these facilities, it's typical that it's a single citywide service area. Um, yeah. And so as a follow-up uh, for me, what um, measures uh, do you feel like we can put in place in the planning process to ensure that we look seriously at uh, future projects as growth related and, and, main, and not neighborhood or project specific? I guess that would be a concern going forward. 
Yeah, so the, uh, the evaluation it, uh, as it relates to transportation is, um, I think, the most apl applicable. Because, um, again, as you look at fire or public safety, um, and parks and recreation, you may have a similar issue of system versus project improvements. But uh, your engineering staff will have to evaluate that based on uh, transportation variables and trip counts and looking at what is this really designed to serve or who is this designed to serve. And I think that process that Mike has spoken of with regards to an evaluation and, it, and the team that will help ensure that the, C, the CIP and IFFP is looked at will help address some of that system versus project improvement evaluation. But, uh, you know, our, our level of expertise is related to the calculation of the impact fee and, and how it all fits together. The project versus system improvements will rely on your staff, the, the city staff, engineering staff, and uh, transportation staff to determine what is the, the benefit that's provided by that improvement. And Mike, this, it feels like a relatively significant additional layer of assessment over, uh, over what you're already doing uh, for determining impact fee eligibility on projects. So I'm a little concerned about your capacity to do that with existing staff and existing resources. So coming back to us uh, when you do that transmittal, I, I would appreciate it if you could do some sort of evaluation around that, mm -hmm. looking at um, how are you going to develop that system that allows the, the assessment level as well as the priority level that we're looking for going forward. It feels like it's, it's, it feels like it's more than you're currently doing. So I'm a little concerned about your capacity. And I'll Thank also you. state that, uh, we'll work on that we don't um, we don't end our uh, service after this impact fee is adopted. Um, it, it is common that we uh, receive calls with regards to specific improvements that are being considered and evaluated, and we we remain a resource for the city to provide insight on. Uh, the evaluation of those improvements and should they be included or ex excluded and, and how that would look. Well, and Phil, uh, truly th this is such an a, a, a improvement over our previous conversations around this and I really appreciate the time yeah. you put into this a and the uh, explanation of the concepts because like we started, it's complicated yeah. and um, you've done a really good job of looking at uh, the whole system and I really appreciate your uh, response to our desire to incorporate as much flexibility in the process as possible. Thank you. And I just have two follow-up questions. So one is that impact fees would be citywide with this map currently that we're looking at. Correct. Okay. The second question I have is, do you know of any other municipality that's looking at uh, digital inclusion or something to that effect for impact fees? Uh, can you define digital so inclusion? So to, to, you know, most, if you look at most cities, there's a digital divide between whether it's east or west or, you, you know, you're looking at uh, just different capita per, you know, the, the income base. Is there any municipality that currently has impact fees for digital inclusion or digital... Like infrastructure or something? Yeah, or infrastructure or? for digital. So are you talking about treating that as utility, essentially? Mm -hmm. and the Impact Fee Act identifies what facilities can be included um, and digital infrastructure uh, is not on that list of, of um, you look like you're contemplating in well it's mind. just that I uh, see the filing cabinets opening up and you're, you've got all your yeah, files out. yeah I'm that, that is what's I'm going through the code you know in my mind but it's not a it's, I'm just trying to comprehend your digital inclusion but yeah we're we're the, the statute is specific to sewer, water, transportation, public safety, uh, parks and recreation, environmental mitigation, uh, you know, so it, it's specific to that and, and we don't go beyond w what is included. Uh, power can be included if there's a municipal power provider um, and, and that's really, that's what we're relegated to with regards to the inclusion of facilities. Okay, Aaron. It's good work you've done. <laughs> and it's allowed us, I think, to have a broader vision of the possibilities and as the capital city um, with quite a, a balance in our impact fee uh, budget that we have yet to wrestle with. I think you've given us some new understanding to 
envision how this can be used in, in new ways that still fit the bill. And going back to when Stan was asking, asking you questions about how we make that distinguishment between um, system-wide and project-based uh, service of a, or um, objectives of a project, do you foresee that we would need to make those kind, that we'd need our engineers to make those justifications before we commence with a project to protect against uh, you know, litigation? Or do we need to make a case is what I'm asking. If we're getting creative. Yeah, so we, we typically include a, um, a guiding factor with regards to, you know, for transportation, that being arterials and collectors on a roadway. but. Again, because Salt Lake is unique in, in the types of transportation and, and the impact on your system, um, we, we in essence rely on the impact fee, the list of impact fee facilities to help define what that is. Uh, so transportation, for example, is facility driven in that we identify the types of improvements that are impact fee eligible and we use that list to help determine moving forward what can be included and what can't be included. So a key variable is your plan, the impact fee facilities plan as you move forward, that we evaluate the projects that are being proposed uh, in context of that plan. And there may be some variation where we're taking a roadway improvement that was proposed in one portion of the community and that's shifting as long as it's meeting the intent and uh, in essence spirit of that plan, then we can justify that improvement. But we do have to go back to the plan itself and, and still uh, make an evaluation based on what we've proposed as system improvements within that plan itself. So we can't adopt this and then s let it sit on the shelf without that, an evaluation as you go through that CIP process, especially as it relates to this, this the capital uh, facility-driven components, which is public safety and transportation. It's really just the parks variable that's a little more flexible as it relates to future investment. But that is a, a great recommendation, and I'll look at that as we put some of that in the plan itself. Great. We appreciate you being here. And like I said, Mike, this is going to be a longer conversation, as you know that this was a priority last year for the council and moving forward we've got a deadline so thank you very much thank and you. appreciate you being here yeah thank you mr philpott so we're going to go back to item number two which i do believe the cvs crew is here uh, so the cvs pharmacy cvs pharmacy rezone and alley vacation uh, we have casey stewart who is a senior planner with the city uh, and nick tarbett who is our council po council policy analyst with this So Nick, tell us why we're back talking about CVS. All right, I'll give a brief intro on the background and then let Casey um, give his presentation. This item was originally briefed back in October of last year. Um, it's a rezone the applicant was requesting from RO to CB and an alley vacation. Um, in between, at, at the briefing in October, the council had some questions about the parking. It was a rather large parking lot and they asked the applicant to review that again and come back with a, uh, a smaller parking lot based off of the Planning Commission's recommendation for the rezone, and that's what is being considered here tonight. So I'll let Casey take it from there. Thank you. Up on the screen is an aerial photograph of the properties in question. You'll see on the corner, this is in Sugar House, 20, 21st South and 1300 East. The corner uh, properties outlined in orange there. So the corner currently houses an existing car wash. Uh, that is zoned Sugar House Business District, and that is not part of the rezoning request. However, that is where the proposed building would go, the CVS branded pharmacy building. The applicant could construct a CVS pharmacy on that site. Um, it would need to accommodate parking and, and landscaping and that sort. <coughs> Um, the applicant desires instead to increase the building footprint and push most of the parking to the north on the two properties uh, just 
north of that, also highlighted in orange, there are two property zoned residential office. The applicant would like to change that zoning to uh, community business, CB. And this is the reason. Residential office does not allow for retail use, uh, nor does it allow for parking lots to support an off-site retail use. However, the CB district does. Uh, that's the, the crux of the request, is it does allow for parking lots to service off-site um, retail uses. The uh, Planning Commission considered the request and came back uh, with a vote um, to only recommend rezoning one of the parcels, which is the smaller RO parcel, um, concerned about the, the large parking area. The, um, the master plan for this area is the Sugar House Master Plan. And the goal of that is to include, is to better integrate residential uses with small business uses and to increase a residential presence through a mixed land use pattern. The master plan actually calls out the RO district as supporting that goal in this area. Um, and these two properties to the north have been zoned RO uh, since 1995 with the adoption of the zoning ordinance. Uh, the CB zoning district, although one of the city's lower intensity commercial districts, only permits seven types of residential uses, whereas the RL zoning district permits 13 types of residential uses, along with low impact office type uses. By changing to a CB district, the parcels become more solid, solidly in the commercial category with less incentive and potential for residential development in the future which residential uses are desired on the periphery of the Sugar House Business District. And that's, uh, again, we're speaking to the RO District being called out in the master plan as supporting that goal. Um, also, it's worth noting that the CB District uh, does not have a limit on the amount of building coverage, whereas the RO District does. Um, uh, on the flip side of that, the RO District's height limit is taller than the CB District. So there would be that uh, potential visual impact if changed to CB. Um, in 19, excuse me, in 2005, uh, with some rework on the Sugar House Master Plan, the, the zoning for these, this area was considered, and, and again, RO was retained as the preferred uh, zoning district for that area. So uh, staff initially had a recommendation of denial for both uh, requests to, to change both parcels to RO. The Planning Commission, as I mentioned, uh, split that. And uh, the applicant has been working on various designs for their project. Uh, they have a design that would work just on the corner parcel itself. Um, it, it meets the building footprint requirements and the parking requirements. Um, there are, the Sugar House Business District, however, has a, a long list of design requirements um, that haven't necessarily been, um, uh, it, there's a question as to how many of those the, that proposal meets um, regarding width of sidewalk, um, entrances on streets, and th those things. So uh, I'm not sure what the latest plan the applicant uh, has uh, for that site alone, but the preferred alternative is to incorporate the, the two parcels to the north with the parking, total parking for the whole project at 44 stalls, down from 67 stalls uh, last year, uh, with increased landscaping, and uh, again, the, the building footprint stretch to occupy most of that corner parcel. So with that, I'll, I'll just leave it there and, and answer any questions. Questions, council members? Stan and then Andrew. Um, the uh, 13th at this particular location is a really pretty incredibly congested area. And how have you looked at accommodating uh, access into that parking based on uh, the congestion that's pretty frequent there on 13th? I mean, it's not uncommon for traffic to black up. Uh, I'm pretty sure that's not a sea level intersection. Uh, 
I, I think it's pretty common for traffic to back up north, uh, the southbound traffic to back up north for quite a ways there several times during the day. Did you look at that as part of your assessment um, with transportation? Transportation consider that and they work with the applicants on uh, dealing with the number of access points there. Um, the existing alley, um, as you saw up on the screen, has an access, has a cut right there um, that would be retained. Um, and there would be an access, uh, another access retained further north for the, uh, what's currently used by the dental office building. So, um, does it at that? I'm, I'm trying to call and uh, I can't really tell from the map, but it seems to me that a left turn is allowed uh, from northbound into to where we're proposing that. And is that a concern? Because this is right where 13th narrows down to one lane, it's where traffic backs up going in the other direction. And I'm just concerned about access uh, into that parking lot and if we're going to aggravate the congestion. Um, we already have there by allowing uh, multiple turning maneuvers into that parking area. And, and, and that, that's a good question. I mentioned it's been looked at. Um, our focus was more a, a bigger picture. Should we change the zoning versus looking at the, all the details yeah. of the project? So I'm wondering, so. Nick, if we might want to do a follow up with transportation on that. In particular, I'm, as I'm looking at this right now in, in your picture, I do believe that. Um, a left turn is allowed there, and I'm just wondering if it should be um, based on this proposal. Um, regardless of moving forward or not, I, I, I have some real concerns about uh, traffic movement, especially uh, people trying to turn across a traffic lane uh, to access that uh, parking lot there. So I'm wondering if we might want to mitigate that. And that's that when proposal. going northbound on 13th, you're saying? North, uh, northbound on 13th, I believe, I can't tell from yeah, it the, looks like the, the traffic uh, uh, barriers there, but I believe this is beyond that barrier. And, and m even if it's not legally allowed, I'm pretty sure people will try to yeah. turn left into that parking lot. So I think that's a real concern. We, we do have the developer here. They have their proposed plan. They may have looked into that already. Um, so I just. Let's so get back to it because I'd like yes. to hear from transportation as well yep. on, on that if you could follow up. The other question I have is um, around um, just the concept in general of moving a parking lot into what is currently primarily a residential encouraged zone. Um, and, and what were the conversations at the planning staff level and at the planning commission level around that? I mean, or is there any hesitation in looking at uh, rezoning this um, primarily, um, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, my sense is that what we currently have it zoned for is trying to encourage some residential component. Um, this pretty much eliminates all opportunity for a residential component. So how was that addressed at the staff and commission level? Well, that, that was a, a big part of the reason staff recommended against changing the, the zoning. Uh, the CB district does allow uh, still for some residential uses. Um, the, the RO uh, kind of builds on that and it has a, more residential uses, but it allows for a taller height to incorporate uh, some of those in a residential office combination. So uh, yeah, that, that was really ma main, the main concern between the first staff and, and the planning commission was the, the size of the parking lot and, and kind of the, that in encroachment. Okay. And so some of the mitigation that has been provided uh, by the developer is above and beyond what's required by the zone. Is that correct? Um, how are we ensuring that actually happens after the rezone? Yeah, th they're providing extra landscaping for the parking lot, but there is. A, a do we have a, a do, do we have a proposal for a development agreement? I mean, do we have anything in place that would assure us that once the rezoning is in place, that we don't see a different proposal? Uh, currently, there's nothing okay. in All effect. Right. Thanks. So you said there's a height difference between CBD and the RO. What's the difference? Do you know offhand? 
between the, the height, yeah, the RO has got a higher um, max height. Right, it's, it's got a maximum height of 60 feet, uh -huh. which is approximately five stories. Uh, the CB zone has a max height of 30 feet. Of 30? Yeah. Okay. Um, I have a question because I've never seen 40 cars at a, at a pharmacy before. Um, and then this is based on the zoning, but that's a, let's say it's excessive parking, but we know why we have parking. Is there any agreement about using the parking lot for joint ventures, um, sharing or anything like that? with other businesses? Because Sugar House can be pra packed parking-wise at times. Uh, that would kind of, we'd have to look to the applicant to kind of explain what they anticipate for that parking lot. There is, I'm not aware of any proposals to open it up to other uses. Mm -hmm. What are the residential options for a CBD zone, you said? There's still some applications you can't have for residential in those zones. Do you know offhand? How much are we losing, essentially, in the future uh, option to re residential if we rezone this? Uh, well, I'm looking for so the RO zone. I, I know that the change in the number of, of allowed types is from 13 down to 7. I, I couldn't pinpoint exactly what those types of uses are. Okay. To, so to there's still about order. seven types are still allowed in a CBD zone, but you lose six or seven right. um, by rezoning this? By essentially lose a, a few options residential-wise right. by rezoning it? Right. There's still some options yeah. in there? Sorry to make you repeat. Will you tell me, Andrew had a, a great point that I was going to ask in regards to the parking. I, I've never seen 44 people at a pharmacy before, but what does the current zoning allow per, I mean, do we have a zoning for parking there in that area for per thousand square feet, or how do you justify the parking stalls for, for a, a business like this? Um, so yeah, for a retail use, it's typically, um, I think it's two, two stalls per thousand, and that, that's what they're proposing two stalls per thousand that would be make it 26 right 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 that that's that's the required minimum they're going above that okay so it, it looks like in this they mentioned that the proposal originally had 67 stalls and then they brought that down to 44 but we're only requiring 26 Correct. is that right yes okay um, and to Stan's point, I just want to make sure I understood correctly. Um, they're asking for um, the zone change without, with you know, offering you know the bus stop, the wider sidewalks, and things of that nature. But with there's no real hook to ensure that that actually happens. Is that correct? Currently, there's not. But th we could incorporate a development agreement. If, yeah. If the council wanted to do that. Yeah. Charlie. And then if there are no further questions for staff, we'll have the petitioner come up and give them five minutes that we can ask them questions. So the last time we had something similar to this in this area was with the Kmart property where Walmart uh, currently is. Um, there was a misunderstanding at the time that if the city didn't allow the rezone uh, that Walmart would pack up their bags and go away and and, and and what ended up happening is we now have Walmart on that site the site was not rezoned which tied the hands of the property owner so that they couldn't do the types of renovations that they wanted to do not only on the building but in the parking lot and I, I worry that sometimes you know we we look for the perfect um, when we're talking about zoning, instead of looking at what the practical reality is going to be, um, not rezoning this is not going to mean that CVS is going to go away. It doesn't mean that they're not going to have a parking lot. It do, all it means is that it will eliminate more options for them to actually improve the site. Now, if we want to go ahead and do a development agreement, I have absolutely no problem with that, and I think that that would make sense to, you know, at least ensure that some of the things that are being said are going to happen. But 
we've tried this before. I mean, we, we think that if we you know, hold our ground and say, you know what, we're gonna hold, hold fast to what the zoning requires, that we're gonna end up with something um, that in the long run will probably not be as good as it could be if we were to be a little bit more flexible, so. Okay, we would invite the petitioner to come forward. And just so the public is aware, we have the public hearing uh, scheduled for this item on August 9th. Thank you. Would Very you like much. to present yes. and then we can go to questions? My name is Adrian Bell. I'm an attorney with Holland and Hart. I want to thank the council for uh, accommodating our schedule today and setting aside some time for us. We appreciate the accommodation. Um, to, today, on behalf of the applicant, we have Jeff Malmstone with Armstrong Development Properties. We also have uh, Jerry Tully with Somas. Jerry's going to walk through a, a presentation of the revised site plan and he'll highlight the progress we've made since October. Um, and then we, of course, are here to answer any questions and welcome your feedback and comments. Uh, and just to touch on a point that you raised earlier about the residential uses that are allowed uh, in CB versus RO. CB still allows multifamily housing. It allows assi assisted living. There are residential uses that could, um, that are permitted there. The CB zone uh, does prohibit some more problematic residential uses, such as substance abuse and transitional housing facilities, which are currently allowed in the RO zone. So just to clarify, there's pros and cons on both sides. If we get the technology working. Well, I'll ask a question jumping on Charlie then. Um, if the rezone doesn't happen, what does the development potentially change? <laughs> <laughs> well, hopefully we'll get this working because part of what we were asked to do was look at the options available yeah. to us, starting with parking, but we looked at all options. Currently, we're a commercial user. We're retail. We have one corner. We have beneficial control of three parcels right now, separated by your alley. Uh, the one on the corner is already zoned commercial, and we have a commercial use, and we have we looked at is there a site plan? Can we get that you to speak in it? the microphone? Oh, I'm sorry, I thought I was. There we go. <laughs> the the corner parcel is commercial, and we're a commercial use, so we do have what would essentially be a permitted use. Now, Casey pointed out there are design you know criteria, which there always are. We will have to work with our architecture team and planning team to get through that. But, you know, generally what happens is you've got three parcels right now that are predominantly asphalt with one older building on the north end of the third parcel. We would come in and take the corner parcel, uh, build a smaller store, uh, probably, you know, less product offering in that location. We'd have a parking lot that serves our need. And instead of having parking adequately screened on the northern parcels, we would end up with a new parking lot that enters onto the uh, 21st South. Okay. I think one thing that's important to keep in mind, this is the existing condition. Uh, it goes to, I think, uh, Mr. Penfold's uh, question about traffic access. You know, currently, the entire 21st South frontage is continuous driveway. As part of our proposal, we'd be closing the majority of that and limiting to one driveway at the furthest point possible along 21st. Can I get a clarification on that? Because that's part of your drive-through, isn't it? Is that an entrance and an exit, or is that just an exit in your proposal? It's an entrance and an exit. Okay. And the drive-through does not enter, does not exit directly onto the street. It turns back in. Uh, and I recall that from our, our previous conversation about that, and I think you made some modifications to that based on some direction from planning yeah. staff. 
So in terms of zoning, you can see here the red parcel is the commercially zoned parcel that we could occupy with a permitted use. The blue parcels, the Planning Commission basically came up with a split the baby scenario of, well, how about we recommend zoning the smaller of the two blue parcels, which then leaves the larger one, which has the building on it, with no parking. So we'd end up with uh, a building we own with no parking really associated with it and a parking configuration that doesn't really serve the function of what we're looking for. The real reason we need to do all this is the code that says we cannot serve one parcel with off-site parking in a, an RO zone. And your alley functions as the differentiator between whether it's on-site or off-site. If not for the alley, we could do a consolidation plat and bring it all into one parcel and make it a cohesive development. So we looked at the two options as you suggested. One was, you know, what can we do on the rezone and manipulate the site plan? We went from 67 spaces which were permitted in the code. You know, we, we were above the minimum, but, but we were not uh, above the maximum. So 67 was permitted. We went down to 44. Uh, I just went out and did some checking on my own. Uh, the Walgreens has 44 or 45 spaces. The uh, McDonald's has 44 or 45 spaces. You know, one thing to keep in mind, parking is the interesting thing in, in all subjects, but in retail, if we build too much parking, it affects our uh, bottom line pro forma. If we build too little, it affects our market acceptance. The one thing that we're really trying to do is come up with a parking lot that, while you may say it has extra spaces, there's nothing worse than having someone trying to go through a parking uh, lot looking for a space where the parking is tight to begin with, and you've got people maneuvering all different ways. We believe that parking should be a safe and easy experience for the user and therefore eliminate some of the congestion. Uh, the store that I shop at a lot that I hate to go to is the Smith's on 9th and uh, 21st. I usually end up parking on the side street just so I don't have to go into that parking lot because that parking lot's always full. Uh, we don't have curbside parking at this location. So we came up with a plan that enhanced the landscape buffers, reduced the parking. We have adjacent to what is tra classified by transportation as one of the worst bus stops in the city that they would love to see salvaged somehow. We come up with a, a privately owned bus waiting plaza adjacent to that stop. We come up with a cover over that with benches so that people can be away from the curb, away from the splashing puddles. Uh, there's a turn lane, there's no turn lane there, it's a through lane, turn lane traffic on 13th. The alley remains open, and you can see on the uh, bottom of the screen, we push the driveway access on 21st all the way away from the intersection. What that does is, and it's one of those really frustrating turning movements, cars that are turning westbound off of 13th onto uh, 21st, they're halfway through their turning motion in a left-hand turn, Someone makes a right-hand turn. Somebody tries to go into the first driveway of the car wash, and you've got cars stacked up into the intersection, dropping it from a level of service of D probably to F minus. And that happens more often than not. We consolidate driveways on 13th so that we have good flow there. Uh, so this was the plan that we looked at after we met with you last time and said, how can we improve? Listening to what the community council told us, recognizing that, okay, the one thing they told us that they'd really love us to do is go away. We're not gonna go away. We can comply with a lot of things, but go away wasn't really one of them. Uh, there were also co public comments about why are you registered in Delaware as a corporation? Why can't you be registered in Utah as a corporation? Well, that goes beyond zoning and I didn't even you know, think about getting an answer to that one. So I think we've come up with a plan. We've got the two doors that were requested on the two corners. We've done just about everything that we can reasonably do from what the community council asked for, other than go away. Uh, if we went to the permitted use, 
we end up leaving the existing building there. We leave the asphalt that serves that area there. We put the building on the corner, which is what the master plan wants us to do. We still have to work out, you know, doorways here, the problem becomes if all of our parking is on the west side of the building, we have to get a door that accesses the sidewalk out towards the bus stop. It's an ADA accessibility issue on a sloping site. This is the site plan that meets the code, meets the ADA, and gets us what we need. Now, where that final door location is, I don't know. Your question about how do you have assurances, well, it's zoning. We haven't really come in here with a contractual offer of we will do this. What we're telling you is we have modified our plans quite a, quite a bit over quite a lot of time with a lot of input. We're committed to doing what we say we're going to do. Whatever makes you feel comfortable, we're happy to sit down and have that discussion uh, because I think those things come out in a discussion rather than a, you know, terse meeting where you've got a few minutes to make your point. So that's where we are. We can do either just the corner or we can really clean up the entire area and get rid of some of the things that are there. Uh, one thing that became, you can go forward a minute. This is the elevation in terms of height that we're looking at. And just to skip forward. If we don't rezone, this came up in a discussion with the community council. If we don't re rezone these two parcels and we build the building on the corner, we're left with two underutilized parcels that someone is gonna see value in. Now, this is not our proposal. I just did a what if as a designer to see what could go in. This would be a 60 unit multifamily apartment project that could fit on those with parking. And that's the height that you would be looking at within the code. That's about a 60 foot high building. And those houses are on Douglas Street below them. The RO zone allows a lot more density going in. In my early talks with transportation, uh, they specified that the residential component of the RO could produce a lot more traffic at that corner than just the single commercial business. So we did look at the what if there, but that's not part of what we're saying. This was just, if you want to know the comparison between the RO and the CB, it's, it's that height versus that height. Thank you very much, Mr. Tolley. Uh, council members, do you have any questions for the petitioner before uh, we move on? Stan? Uh, just a comment, not a question. Um, the direction of my questions around agreements are that uh, it's pretty standard for us when we're looking at um, going forward where you've made some concessions to ensure that those are in place because once we change our zoning, we have no control over enforcing those. So it was not directed to you specifically. No. It's directed actually to previous developers who may have, may or may not have burned the city on an agreement. So um, uh, please understood. don't take that personally. And we're nothing like other developers. <laughs> take my word for it. No, we, we'd be happy to sign whatever you needed us to in terms of yeah. agreements. We would welcome that discussion, quite frankly. If, if I may just ask about that, maybe to help speed up that process, would the council in discussing the development agreement be interested in more or less this list that has been identified by the developer? Nick, I wanted to give you a heads up. I'm a little reluctant to, to be specific until we hear from the public. Okay. Um, and so I just wanted to give you a heads up that that's probably something we'd be looking at moving forward, but okay. I didn't want to get too specific until we hear that public comment as well. And, and we recognize we're not living in the world of the perfect. We're, we're trying to come up with a solution that meets our needs, responds to the community, and runs within the guidelines that you all operate under with codes and ordinances. Great. Thank you very much. We appreciate you being here. Thank you for right, your time. Thank you. So we are moving on to item number four, which is a street closure on 1700 East between Emerson Avenue and Logan Avenue. Uh, we have Wayne Mills, who's a senior planner, and Brian Fulmer with council staff. And is Nick Norris going to be joining us as well, just in case?
Well, good afternoon. This is a uh, proposal to close an unimproved portion of 1700 East between Emerson Avenue, which is 1500 South, and Logan Avenue, which is at 1600 South. The property is located within the Wasatch Hollow open space area, and uh, it was originally platted on early city plats, but not developed because it's in the Emigration Creek riparian area. And with that, I'll turn it over to Wayne for his presentation. And that pretty much sums up the project. The, uh, <laughs> the, uh, just to cover one more thing, the, the overall purpose of this petition is actually to um, implement the Wasatch Hollow Open Space Plan, which was adopted by the City Council in 2011. Um, it provides specific policies and, st and strategies for managing um, and the access to and the restoration of the Wasatch Hollow Open Space Area. So if this uh, particular um, street is closed or this area of property has changed in classification from a street to a uh, city-owned parcel of land, the city would retain ownership and would help to ensure that it um, is maintained as, uh, as city open space. I think Stan's really has a question. I, I see him over here tapping on the mic. So. <laughs> well, first of all, I can't imagine you building a street because that's quite the goalie there. Um, I'm pretty sure the neighbors would uh, be a little upset about it. Um, I do have a question, though, about how we do the land transfer. Um, it's, a, it's currently owned by streets or just city property? I mean, it, I guess it's all general fund, isn't it, Cindy, in this situation? I'm just wondering about the, the sort of transfer of a street over into um, open space parks component. I don't know how that works and if there's any need to consider a transfer of funds related to that. If it were going to an enterprise fund, yes. But not where it's just parks, right. which is just another fund. Uh, yes. Yeah, general They're fund. They're in the same thing. Okay. So, I think we're so it's just an internal mechanism for changing that designation? Okay, that's all I need to know. Sure, Stan, uh, you know, I think to your point, th 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 when we transferred those parcels over to from the golf enterprise fund to the general fund that required that purchase transfer this i don't th I, I think is mostly just a name change great that was easy um i do have another question are there any uh, other streets in this area because it doesn't look like it based on that plat but i imagine there are some other streets that might cross wasatch hollow we looked at all of those um, um, yeah, there's not any, uh, there's not any other streets that I'm aware of that okay. actually cross the Wasatch Hollow area. Okay. The, o the only Thanks. other one close would have been Rose, Cre Rose Crest or Rosewood, and Rosewood. you can see when that when that was built. I mean, it was built to curve around, so right. I think 17th was the only one that there was okay. any sort of a plan for. Thanks. Great. Thank you very much. Okay, Brian, you can stay and Wayne can leave. We're on to item number five, street closure on 1300 South between 900 West and the Jordan River. And Wayne will be replaced by Tracy Tran, who is a planner with the city. Okay, Brian, you're gonna start us off, right? Okay, yes. This, uh, Petition is a, a proposal to close a small section of 1300 South where it uh, goes from 900 West to the Jordan River. It's just the end of the street there. It's currently paved and is being used by a, an auto repair shop for parking. It also facilitates illegal dumping of items into the Jordan River. Beneath this parcel is the confluence of emigration, parleys, and Red Butte Creeks to the Jordan River, and this is uh, potentially part of the Three Creeks project and at some point may allow daylighting of that confluence of the, the creeks to the river. And so I'll turn it now over to Tracy. Um, I don't have much to add. Um, you know, like um, Brian said, this right-of-way isn't currently being used as for a public purpose, so. 
It's just currently being used for parking. For yes, for a business that's right there on and the camping corner. and other things. And for access to right. uh, dumping things <laughs> in the river. <laughs> yeah. Um, it's, it looks like there's uh, parking stalls striped on that uh, property. Is that something we did, or that's not something we did? From what I understand, oh. w what I understand, that was done by the auto repair <laughs> shop. How convenient. Mm. Um, We're proactive over there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so uh, does this property get incorporated in the project to, I mean, we have a parks project to daylight that. And we fund, uh, didn't we fund most of that, Andrew? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So this is just a continuation of that process. Do we have an expectation of, of what this might be? Is this potentially parking access to that park or? Um, we do have representatives from parks here, uh, if you want to. Bring them Parks, in. what do you want to do? Yeah, if you wouldn't mind introducing who you are. Mostly because I'm curious and how are you going to eliminate that dumping in the uh, river access? Great. Uh, I'm Lewis Kogan. I'm Salt Lake City's Open Space Lands Program Manager. And uh, yes, we're, <coughs> we're right in the middle of the uh, public process for design of the project right now. Um, I would say that with regard to this specific property, um, I think that our, our project consultant is looking at what the opportunities are, where we can actually daylight streams, uh, and what parking, if any, we ought to have uh, uh, on this space here or the property, um, either be behind it or immediately above it, so that we can accommodate access and and um, public use of the site. So it, it's it's hard to say exactly what would be on this on this site right here, but the concept drawings I've seen so far um, primarily are looking at um, either the, that area there would probably we would attempt some daylighting on the property. So my concern for that with that question <laughs> is if we've got a business that's currently using this for parking and has taken advantage of doing some of their own striping uh, we might have some issues with that business continuing to use any parking we provide there and uh, create a challenge with the public accessing it, so I just think that's a consideration in our design or conversations. And and my understanding is we own the property, the parcel north, correct? That's correct. And the parcel <coughs> west of that, correct. And the parcel southwest of that, yes. All okay. the small parcels uh, along the east bank of the river, okay, we own. Great, thank you. Seeing no other questions, that was pretty easy. Unless Andrew has something you'd like to say. Great. We are making up time, so we are going to move on to items uh, number six and seven. Uh, they're related together. And I am going to recuse myself. I just don't want there to be the appearance of anything to look like I've influenced or had anything involved with this. I just want it to be a clean cut. So I'm going to turn it over to Stan. and. You're okay with that, Stan? I will, as soon as somebody comes back. I uh, am, yeah, but Charlie, can you see me? Are I you going to stay? just excuse okay. myself. Thank you. This is too high tech for me. Welcome. David is joining us and Nick is staying with us. Oh, that's right. Um, could you give us a quick overview of this? Uh, uh, we're on item number six, rezoning of 211 and 251 North Cornell Street. Let's see. Sorry, all the technical issues seem to be occurring on my watch today. <laughs> okay, this this and was we're to assume that's not related to you. Very or well, could be this coincidental. I, I can vouch that we need a new computer okay. on its way. <laughs> <laughs> all right, we won't we won't make you we won't hold you personally responsible, <laughs> then, Nick, for this. And and I apologize. These two items are actually. Um, presented together. Um, it's also item number seven, which is an alley and Avenue Street closure on this at the same address. Okay, so it's actually three items. It's a rezone request, an alley vacation and a street closure. We've, for ease of use, uh, lumped the alley vacation and street closure together given that they're very similar. Um, this is the area around 250, 211 to 251 North Cornell, as you noted. And it encompasses approximately one and a half acres, a little bit more, 1.57 when you include the property and also the uh, streets and alleys combined. Uh, here's an overview map that shows you the general area, the property circled in red. 
uh, again, as I mentioned, it was 1.57 acres. It's currently zone BP uh, business park, and the request was to rezone it to TSA MUECC, which was the transit station area, mixed use employment center core zone. Uh, had to say that a few times to get used to saying that quickly. Um, the BP is actually a more industrial zone, if you will. There's a lot of allowed uses, uh, such as warehouse, manufacturing, offices that are a permitted use, some of them conditional. So there are potentially more impacts, uh, severe impacts coming out of the existing uses that would be allowed in the BP zone. And the height is capped at uh, 60 feet. Uh, the request was specifically for that MUEC core zone. Um, and the master plan, which would be the North Temple Boulevard master plan, as well as the zoning ordinance, shows that the core area is generally within a quarter mile of a transit stop. Um, and again, that's a general rule, and it would allow 75 feet in height. The master plan, however, would be, and how do I advance on this? The master plan, uh, the North Temple Boulevard master plan, shows that this area, and specifically it would be about where my pointer is, uh, just below where the circle intersects, the going from the yellow to the red, would be uh, the identified as the transition area. So that was the prevailing policy on zoning uh, in our analysis that it was specifically identified in the master plan as being part of the transition area. Um, it was left in place in 2010 as a buffer and part of the action was to allow a future property owner to decide on the zoning for that property. So under this application, we did not require a master plan amendment if it was going to the transition area of zoning. Uh, transition area also allows uh, 60 feet in height, which is in line with what the current BP allows, and it would provide some buffering between the core area and the neighborhoods. Okay, on the alley vacation, uh, this uh, exhibit shows you around these properties, and again, this, there was one parcel down here and then six to the north. There is an alley that's platted that surrounds the properties on all sides, or uh, on the west, north, and south sides, platted at about 16 feet wide. And those alleys have never been developed, and part of the request was to vacate those alleys and also change the zoning of them to be part of the larger development. And then finally, the street closure. This is a kind of oblique view showing where the platted Seward Avenue would bisect the general project area between the block of uh, six parcels and the larger parcel to the south. Uh, again, it's a paper street. In our noticing, we had uh, originally noticed it or had in our planning commission staff reports that you would have a copy of. We had talked about it as Stewart Avenue. It wasn't until later on that we discovered that sometime over time the name apparently changed, the surveyor pointed that out, so it's actually platted as Seward Avenue officially. It's approximately 63 feet wide and 200 feet long. The request was to close and vacate that piece of property and allow a more cohesive development parcel. The Planning Commission did recommend, uh, or did forward a positive recommendation for the rezone, the alley vacation and the street closure. Do you have some questions for me? Any questions? And we do have the petitioner present, if there are any questions for the petitioner. Hi, uh, Andrew. Okay, one. So we're still gonna keep it as a transition zone, technically, so 60 feet is a max height? Yes. Okay. And then everything, I believe, to the south of it is the uh, intense, the more intense zoning. That's a higher uh, max height, uh, correct? Uh, across the street and to the south of it would be the identified as the TSA MUEC core zone, which would be more intense and allow 75 feet in height. Okay. Yeah, uh, depending on what they put in there, it could be pretty overwhelming for the existing homes around it. What's the feedback from the community on that? 
there was some concerns about, again, additional multifamily going into the community mm -hmm. um, and impacts on traffic and things like that. Yeah. Uh, under the current zoning, of course, a warehouse or something that would be allowed would probably bring those same impacts. Mm -hmm. Okay. Any other questions, comments? Okay, thank you. We're scheduled for a public hearing on uh, both of these items on August 9th. So, thanks. And thanks, Peter, for being here. Do you want us up here? Uh, or not? Y you're, it's hard to resist a microphone, isn't it? <laughs> I know. So yeah, would you like, hey, do you have any data? So, so the, only, the only thing I would add, and this is J J Peter Caroon, John Netto, our, my business partner. Um, the only thing that we would add, the reason we requested the, T, um, the TSA core zone was because when we originally purchased the, the, one of the properties, that was the zoning that was listed um, in the city's uh, zoning map and also listed on the county's uh, parcel information. So we had the wrong zoning. We're fine with the, the transitional zoning. It is a more appropriate zone. Okay. And then I, I do know, having read the paper, that there's, there is concern about uh, housing on, on the west side. I actually uh, went and got information from the state and boiled it down to the city to see how much housing, housing affordable housing especially, was on the east side versus the west side and found it's pretty much exactly the, the same amount of housing right now, affordable housing between east, east and west side. If you want that information, I'm happy to email it to the council members but uh, great. if you could share that with Nick and then he can look at distributing that that'd be great sure and having lived in other cities uh, in areas where uh, other people didn't want to live uh, I go back there now and those people um, who uh, like me who could afford to live there then could not afford to live there now so sometimes you have to be careful what you wish for because it ends up flipping over time and the people that uh, you know otherwise uh, you know, couldn't afford that it, that it, or could afford that area um, at that time, ultimately you can't afford to live in the area in the future unless you have protections. And we haven't decided exactly what we're gonna build or how, how okay. big, but you know, we do believe that affordable housing is good if that's where we're gonna go. Any questions for the petitioner? Mm -hmm. Peter, thank you very much for being here and thanks for your uh, thank you. comments. Um, our next item, item number eight, um, I'm wondering if uh, I'm going to take a little liberty with James gone, um, and if we have uh, a few minutes, let's take a break. We have a break scheduled immediately following this item, but let's take that now and please uh, keep that as short as possible, and then we'll come back and uh, talk immediately about number eight, which is an added item on our agenda for 911 dispatch. So we're, uh, we'll take a 10 minute break. Thanks. The 911 dispatch director, Ben Ludke, our policy analyst, and Brian Roberts, Roberts thank you, from the uh, attorney's office. All right, Scott, do you want to give us a quick background and rundown? And you bet. So this is um, an interlocal agreement between Salt Lake County and Salt Lake City and Valley Communications to execute um, an agreement to purchase a computer-aided dispatch system, uh, a records management system, and, and other um, necessary software and hardware um, in order for us to implement the new CAD program. So we've been doing this for about 15 months. I'm um, going through the due diligence of bringing 22 agencies within the county together um, and uh, doing the RFP process and the negotiations with uh, vendors. Uh, and so we've come to the point where we're ready to purchase the software uh, and begin implementation, which will be about a year and a half process to implement. But um, this interlocal agreement is necessary for us to execute that. Great. Would you like to add anything, Brian or Ben? Um, no. Oh. That's the basics. I mean, there's one, uh, just for clarity's sake, there's, there's discussion of a grant from the county, and the dollar figure is slightly wrong. Um, the number in here is 1377. It should be 1337. 
So it's all been balanced out in the, in the process. It was a number that everyone was working on with the, for a long time <laughs> and then discovered at the last minute that it was incorrect. So just full disclosure that do we need Small to make slide. a modification in adoption? I, I don't think so. Uh, the resolution talks of, of, a, of, of authorizing a, the execution of substantially similar document. Um, so it can be worked out on the, on the execution side of it. Um, you're approving the basic concept of what we're doing here. And then the execution phase will, will get that fixed. So we're still looking at no additional costs from Salt Lake City. That the entire funding will come from state, county, and federal grants. Um, that's the way it still looks. I think we've negotiated a pretty good deal. The overall package is worth a little over $13 million. Um, and we negotiated quite a discount of about $5.5 million. And so um, all agencies in the Valley will be, um, all public safety entities in the Valley will be a part of this system, which is absolutely fantastic. The idea right now with between Salt Lake, um, DPS, VEC, and UPD, we transfer about 10,000 calls a month. This would eliminate the transfer of those calls. Uh, we handle about 1.1 1 .1 or 1.2 million 911 calls between the two 911 centers um, in the Valley, and to think that 10,000 a month is a lot. And so uh, to, to eliminate that has been worth all the effort of keeping these cats corralled for the last year and a half. Great, thank you very much. Thank you for getting us on the agenda. We wrapped it up and I, I know I rushed it a bit, but thank you very much for accommodating. Great, thank you. Okay, we are gonna move on to item number nine, the homeless service services side evaluation process update. Uh, we're grateful that we have Gail Miller, who was a homeless service site evaluation commission. Uh, she was the co-chair with that, as well as David Litvak, the deputy chief of staff for the administration, and Liz Bueller from this is the final showing of your current is this your last status. hurrah is that what this is in this role yes did we have a cake or something i don't know <laughs> i am conflicted i'm only moving about 100 yards down the hall so you'll still see me though i did tell her if it's not vetoed <laughs> <laughs> david do you get to tell us who will be replacing liz because yes, yes, that please. role is so important uh, yes no i i i can talk about that I mean, I don't have anyone at an answer, but I can tell you that we're, we're thinking. It's in process? Yeah. Okay. It's in process. Welcome, Ms. Miller. Thank you. So, um, good afternoon, council good members. Good afternoon. Thank you, everyone, for being here. So, Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you. So, I thought um, I would just maybe get us started with a quick introduction and then uh, turn some time over to Liz and, and, uh, and Ms. Miller, if she has any comments, and then really would love to answer any questions that you may have. The, 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 the dual purpose of today's briefing um, is to one, uh, update you on the site selection commission and the process and the work that we've done to this point and some of the next steps. And then we also wanted to take this opportunity to um, update you all on the um, immediate needs down in the Rio Grande and um, some of the steps that we have already taken and are taking uh, with the funding uh, that we receive for mitigation in the Rio Grande area. And so we wanted to cover uh, both of those areas with you um, this afternoon. And <coughs> in, your trans, uh, in the transmittal, there were some additional, there's been some additional information um, since we submitted the transmittal, and uh, particularly with the, the survey, and so we wanna bring that information up to date as well. So we apologize that that was not captured in time uh, for the transmittal, but we wanna uh, make sure that we bring that information to you as well. So uh, as, as you all know, um, with the Site Selection Commission, uh, we did a very uh, aggressive public engagement outreach, kind of a phase one of a public engagement outreach. We held five uh, public engagement workshops. The, uh, <coughs> and, and let me say, the commission was uh, actively engaged and very helpful in 
developing and designing the public engagement workshops and some of our initial thoughts uh, that we had around uh, the engagement, uh, the commission helped us develop a better way uh, to achieve uh, our goals. Our goals with the first public series of public engagement workshops was one, to bring this conversation back to the community and educate the community in terms of the broader aspect that as we talk about site selection, the commission, and the work that we're doing as a city, that is very much connected to the larger conversations about service reform and a different service model. And so we wanted to make sure that those dots were connected because it's very important to the conversation about locations. We also wanted an opportunity to uh, speak um, with the public and get in their input and feedback and really building off of the previous commission's work on when they think about a resource center in the community. So there wasn't specific, right? In the community, in our community. We wanted th their help in prioritizing the various uh, criteria of success that was developed in, in the from the previous commission. So what are the most important factors when they think about a, a resource center in the community? And so able to achieve that. And what you have uh, in the transmittal is from the uh, graphic, graphic recorder, which is a thing. I didn't realize it was a thing until we did this. So graphic recorder to really help us provide uh, a feedback loop uh, to the public so that we were capturing what was being said and to be able to, to provide that feedback in, in a visual. Uh, and so one of the um, attachments to the transmittal was the, gra the graphic recording of the public engagement workshops, as well as uh, when we presented this information to the commission, the graphic recorder was there and capturing the dialogue with the commission at the same time. So both of those uh, were included in, the, um, uh, in your packet. The other piece with the public engagement workshops and a really fundamental piece to the conversation and, and all the conversations moving forward is in addition to having um, dialogue about location, we also wanted to put a human face to this issue. And that when we talk about individuals and families experiencing homelessness, and we talk about a better way to serve individuals and families that find themselves in, that, in the situation, whether at the resource center or different service access points, that we're talking about individuals, we're talking about human beings. And so we started all, with the exception of one, which I'll explain, we started all the public engagement workshops with an exercise around developing empathy and understanding and really asking the public uh, to put themselves uh, in the shoes of someone experiencing homelessness um, and thinking about the types of access to services uh, and what a resource center uh, location, those criteria would look like from that perspective, uh, a very important part of the conversation. The first public engagement workshop that we did was with uh, Saint, at, was at St. Vincent de Paul and was specifically <coughs> uh, designed for uh, individuals experiencing homelessness. And so that's the exception. We didn't do the empathy exercise with, with, with them, but um, I had actually a great turnout. At all of the public engagement workshops, we had a tremendous uh, turnout. So with that background, and then uh, I can speak more in terms of some of those next steps, but I'd like to turn the time over to Liz to talk a little bit more about the public engagement workshops um, uh, before we move forward. I just want to go into some of the details of the results that we heard from these workshops. Um, as David mentioned, we did have a really high attendance. We had 359 attendants across all five workshops. 144 of those attended the client workshop at St. Vinny's and that then across the four others, we had 215 community members. We actually surveyed all the community participants and we found uh, most of them, those that were in the four main community workshops, both lived and worked in Salt Lake City, and in some way they've been affected by homeless services. Either they work in that area, they're in a neighborhood where homeless services are located, or they've had some interaction with homeless individuals. 
When we surveyed the clients who participated, we found out that most of them had slept at the road home the evening before, but we also had a few campers there who were sleeping out either um, in the neighborhood or somewhere else in the city. And the services most used were either at the Wiegand Center, which is the day center, St. Vincent de Paul's Dining Hall, the road home, or the city storage program, a place for your stuff. Um, really, throughout, throughout the workshops, all five of them, the most striking thing was that the responses were so similar between the workshop that we had with the clients of homeless services as well as the greater community. The um, top criteria that everyone mentioned was having easy access to all needed services, preferably in a single location. That would be shelter and day services, medical, case workers. Being close to public transportation, something that was added across all these workshops was being close to affordable public transportation. Either it being free fare zones or being having access to things like high passes, something to help with um, fares. Another key was not being conducive to regional drug trade, and safety is key. We heard that a lot from the clients. A lot of the clients felt that those that are really um, the bad influences in the neighborhood, it's hurting them getting services and getting the help they need. So they want to be removed. They want to be removed around where drugs are prevalent. They want the drug dealers away. And obviously, we heard that from the community as well. The community expressed very, very strongly that they did not want the problems that are currently exp happening on 500 West and 200 South to migrate to any new neighborhood that services might be located. They did not want to see that happen. Other things that other things that we heard is considering the safety of the clients and the neighborhood, so beyond, is, is expanding that beyond just having uh, separating services from drug activity, but just making sure the facility is safe for the clients, but also for the neighborhood that issues don't sp spill over. Making sure that there are adequate number of case managers and client advocates to actually help people exit homelessness, that was key and including also more treatment services from behavioral health and substance abuse. There were some differences that we heard from the clients. They really wish that they could be treated with dignity, that they, they're humans and they are in a difficult situation, but many of them are trying to exit homelessness and to be able to work with case managers to get themselves out of homelessness. And then the other residents really want to remember not just um, the design of the facility and for those that are being served at the facility, but the larger neighborhood where facilities will be located. Think about all of their needs as well if a facility came to their neighborhood. Since that meeting, we've also completed our Open City Hall topic and our Facebook survey. Uh, Open City Hall topic was very similar to the neighborhood engagement workshops. We actually had a, uh, a walk in my shoes exercise where we asked people to pick a scenario someone who's experiencing homelessness and to answer questions as that role, and then we moved into the criteria. The Facebook, the Facebook survey just asked specifically about the criteria. But between those two, we actually had 645 respondents. Uh, Open City Hall, we had 367. Facebook, 278, so we've had great responses online as well. And online, it's, it's pretty much matches exactly what we heard at the neighborhood engagement workshops. Um, the first, it's really the, the same three are exactly the same, but in different order. Not being conducive to regional drug trade and making sure the building, the buildings are, will be designed for safety was the number one concern in the community. Then it was including easy access to all the services, preferably on site. And then finally, being close to public transportation. Th those were the top three. As for asking the input we received from the walk in my shoes, People feel that these individuals would need more job training, medical assistance, and um, behavioral health to really help them exit homelessness. So those are the results. The surveys closed last week. So um, Council, uh, Councilman Rogers, one thing I'd like to add, um, two things I'd like to add. One, at the public engagement workshops, uh, I mentioned that we, the first one specifically designed for individuals experiencing homelessness, but at all of our workshops, we had individuals and families there that are experiencing homelessness. Uh, so they were actively engaged in the public engagement workshops, all of them. Uh, the, other, the other piece is uh, our staff uh, in, in 
community and neighborhoods uh, was incredible. Uh, these five workshops were held within a one week time frame, uh, all in the evening except for the one at St. Vincent de Paul. Uh, and, you, it, it, and we could not have pulled that off, obviously, uh, with the, without the dedication and commitment uh, of our wonderful staff who helped facilitate small group conversations. And so I just wanna let you know how, uh, how incredible our staff is. Thank you very much for your presentation. So uh, questions now from council members to the panel. Stan and then Aaron. Elizabeth, I just wanted to follow up on a comment you made, um, particularly around the affordable transit. Did you get any deeper in that? I mean, um, uh, what I think I heard you say was that existing fares are not okay, that we need to look at, at affordability with some sort of subsidy to existing fares. Or if it's not that, it was it, we heard suggestions of having, setting up a private transportation system or, again, having some type of free fares, discount something, that it was clients that were talking. And this was in conjunction with being close to public transportation. Just being able to afford fares was very important. So did, did, was there an additional translation into access to transit that – came out of that conversation as well? Because I, I imagine there are sort of two things going on. There's the immediate access to transit, whether that's, I mean, all forms, but also affordability if you have the access. So you heard both those things. Right, and w access to transportation was actually the only thing listed in our criteria, and it was across the board. Affordability was added to that okay. item. Okay, so um, as we're going forward, do we have a mechanism for incorporating something like that in our transit plan? Um, as we're looking at, uh, I mean, that seems like a logical um, inclusion to say we might want to consider that as part of our transit conversation at that level in our transit plan, but we may need to be really having a conversation about affordability for specific populations. And we should, let me, let me say that conversation hasn't happened with transportation, but now it will. Yeah. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Um, uh, Gail, um, can you talk a little bit about your perception of the public engagement and also um, in this process and in the broader process around site selection, conversation with providers, existing providers? Um, I, I wish I could answer the question clearly. <laughs> I, I think from my experience that the providers are all on board with what we want to do and that they all know that it's a benefit to them as well as the homeless and that they would like to see these plans go forward. Um, does that, is there a, Ask me the question again. Let me see well, if I'm, I'm understanding I'm, I'm, what I'm, you're asking. I'm, I'm particularly interested in how providers were have been engaged in the process, okay. they, and, and I think they have. They have uh, been very yeah. engaged and but very supportive. Your sense is they're very supportive. Yes, they're very supportive, and they they feel like there's an opportunity right now that we've never had before. Okay. Great. And that they would be willing to support. I can't speak for them, but my perception is they would be willing to support this process and this program to completion. Okay. Great. And one more question for the mayor, if I may. Sure. Welcome, mm -hmm. welcome, Mayor. Um, Thank you. Um, one of the things, that, this came up in our uh, uh, ribbon cutting this morning, and I think mm -hmm. it's something that has uh, it's come to me uh, uh, personally in the way of, of a question when people talk about the need for services. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and so this idea of uh, where do we provide the funding and the sort of really significant lack of, of access to treatment, in particular mental health and substance use treatment services mm -hmm. on a state level and broader level and Medicaid expansion, all those things. And part of what I'm hoping in, in our role in this process, uh, in particular with things like our social workers now at the police mm -hmm. department, is that we really start tracking and documenting this gap and this need. Because um, we talk anecdotally a lot to the state about what our needs are, but you know, the reality, I think that a lot of us 
I hope a lot of us agree on is that Medicaid expansion could go a long way to helping mm -hmm. a lot of the people we're talking about in particular. How are we connecting those dots? And are we in a, in a way that's sufficient in your view for that political leverage that we're gonna need to keep putting on those other funders? Because um, it just, it concerns me that the city, I think the city has some willingness to get into the service delivery component, but it, it gets so expensive so right. quickly and it's really, in my mind, a county role and a state mm -hmm. role in particular. How do you see this going forward? So there's a couple ways that it will potentially could play for us. The Medicaid expansion piece that we worked on during the session is really um, dollars that are targeted at this population. And those dollars um, would be drawn down uh, specifically for mental health care and addiction treatment. Um, obviously, there would be access to those dollars for other things, but the population that uh, really would benefit from those dollars are the people we are trying to help. The other element to that is the county is at the table having dialogue around their role and they are very interested in playing the role they have been playing. Um, so are other service providers in this community and so with the ongoing funding that the state has committed for service, that there is a real potential there for us uh, to draw down the dollars we need to provide the additional services that are required to, to help people move back to independence. All of that being said, um, we have to create the system and we are in that process of developing a whole new system of service delivery. And all the players are still at the table, which is, as you know, not easy to do in a, in a real systemic change. Um, but everyone is at the table. The dollars are still available. The county is looking for additional funding as well. Um, the commitments are big. And it is a matter of getting us this, the system piece completed so that you are able to track everything. But we are very clear that we have to track everything. The county is very clear and so are the service providers. So that's actually encouraging for me because I, I, I appreciate the funds that are available, but I mm -hmm. think that uh, we're gonna see a far greater need than our existing funding streams. And so having the ability to make those cases going forward, I think mm -hmm. is a really important part of how we design these systems. And it sounds right. like you have a comfort level that that's happening in this process. It is happening. Um, you know, it's hard because we're not at the table all the time working on it. Um, because it is county and service provider level. Um, but we do our check-ins. We do know that those discussions are happening, those meetings are happening, and teams are working on the system. And David could probably answer this question a little more if he would like to add to it. But I, I am confident, Stan, that even with the additional dollars that we have the potential to bring into the pool, Everybody is very conscientious about how we spend that money and that we are creating measurable outcomes. But in my discussion with Aaron the other day, we also have to help people um, that are coming forward for help but maybe aren't quite ready to head down this path of recovery. Um, but yet bring them into the potential get them into the services so that the potential exists there. Thank you. Um, kudos to your outreach team, Mayor. Mm -hmm. They pulled off what other teams have tried in the past, not necessarily with this same discussion, but it was a really expedited timeline mm -hmm. and uh, an ambitious goal of talking to basically our whole community. And um, I look forward to the results as they come out, but I've heard um, 
a, a, a lot of responses from um, constituents who have had the opportunity to participate. I wish that I'd had the opportunity to participate, but I was out of town. This is a really, you know I'm a visual thinker, so this was pretty cool, but unfortunately the, the pixel size was, is, I can't read it, yeah. except for really <laughs> big letters. So you might have to correct me on a couple things. I have two questions for Liz and two questions for Gail. We'll start with Liz. Okay. Um, the part on here, and you mentioned this, about not conducive to drugs. I think I right. could read that on yeah. here. And you talked about, um, when, I, when I read that before you talked about mm -hmm. it, it, I thought it might be about access to services, but it sounds like it was about um, the environment of safety and mm -hmm. protecting from um, people not accessing services using that population as a shield. Can you, I can just see how w that kind of language um, can be misconstrued and maybe talk about what the status of that discussion is. And Gail, you might have input too from the commission side about um, whether or not we limit access to services based on people currently using. Was that a part of the workshop discussion and has the commission had an opinion? So it's. And it's not specifically about denying services to those that are using illegal substances but want treatment. It's really about those that might be in the current neighborhood who are, who are using drugs but do not want services and separating that from, because with them come the drug dealers and other um, crime. So what the people who are seeking services, and they might be struggling to stay clean, is they want to be removed from that. It's not about denying services to someone just because they might be using drugs. It's really about getting that population away who isn't interested in help, just separating those from who really want the services. What about people who are using but don't want services but want a place to sleep that they don't have to wait in line for, that in between? That, I, I think there are all other gradations on that. Let's take 500 West, for example. Um, there's, I think there are some people there who, and what we've done a survey of people who are using 500 West is they know about services, but they're not using any of the services. They're going down there because that's where they can buy their drugs. And so it's one, dealing with that population. And then, yes, there are people who use services who are also using drugs in that neighborhood, helping those individuals. And you provide them with the basic services until you know they're ready to accept services to get them out of the shelter and into housing. So it's there, we're talking about different groups. Yeah. yeah maybe if I could, um, Council Member Mendenhall also, because th I think you're asking great questions. Mm -hmm. And so when we talk about conducive to drugs and the regional drug trade, there's also a very specific location component. So right now we know that in the current environment, being very close to 5th South, 6th South, individuals drive in, get their drugs, maybe hang out a little while and drive out. <coughs> when we talk about, and it gets, and, and, and as we look at this, there's even some uh, criteria that may uh, conflict with each other a little bit. When we, we were having this discussion the other day, that when we talk about the free fair zone and being within the free fair zone, very important in terms of access to services and for individuals experiencing homelessness, the ability to get around within where a lot of the services are. The free fare zone also contributes to the, the drug trade. Um, drug dealers are, are in and out on the free fare zone. Now, would that change if they had to pay for tracks? I'm not sure. Um, but the notion of this conduciveness to the regional drug trade has a very, in this conversation, in the conversation with the public was more, the feedback that we're getting was more geared towards the access and the location and not getting, you know, no feedback saying that services should be limited to individuals who are utilizing drugs. There is a significant feeling in the community that there are those, we know about the criminal element that are preying on the homeless, uh, taking advantage of the homeless. There's also a feeling of many individuals say along 500 West are not necessarily individuals experiencing homelessness 
but more there because of the, the drug trade and maybe leave at the end of the day. And so, um, so it's really that conduciveness in terms of location mm -hmm. rather than access to services. Do you want to follow up? I do have a, a follow up and it's based a little bit on a model we saw when we were visiting Seattle. Um, and I'm thinking of this um, spectrum of need in particularly substance using populations. Um, but we saw a model in, in Seattle where they very deliberately targeted uh, men who are consuming alcohol. Um, a significant uh, population in the homeless community, but uh, problematic in the shelter setting, but they created a housing setting for them and moved them into housing without any restrictions to their consumption and saw some really dramatic results as a result, including a reduction in consumption. And so um, I think this is one of those opportunities that um, we have of looking at a spectrum of services uh, uh, that are available to a lot of people. And it makes sense that some of these populations um, get uh, segregated. I don't like that word, but um, I, I don't quite know what else to Separated. say at this moment. Um, but but uh, <laughs> let's, uh, let's say or provide a variety of services. Um, and I don't think we have that menu of services available. So it gets back to this, how do you document the needs and how you document the concerns so that we can start advocating? Because um, that's a pretty big lift to say we want to go to the state or even the county and say we want you to fund transitional housing for people who continue to use. Um, and I get that that's a big lift, but it also can have a really pretty significant impact in the current sort of micro population that we're dealing with all this sort of uh, impact immediately, but it can also help us get people started on that path to treatment who aren't quite ready to jump to a full treatment mm -hmm. uh, bed, which and tends to be a cold turkey kind of programming. And additionally, that gets at some of the most problematic people on the street, which is, you know, the money is coming to fix Rio Grande, so to speak. And um, we know beds will be limited for certain populations, and so it becomes uh, an easy transition to make, which is a, it, I'm concerned about the transition to say, we're going to limit access to certain levels of enhanced service maybe based on their compliance with treatment, <coughs> let's say, because we know we're gonna have a limit on beds. And yet it doesn't, that might inadvertently not clean up the issue that we were tasked with cleaning up in the first place because we're leaving the people who are the most difficult on the street because they're not yet willing to participate. So I don't, I don't know if I can answer your question, but I do want to say that we can't help everyone all at once. And we have to do it in layers. And one of the visions that we've had is to get the people out of the area that want help, that are helpable, and that will expose those who need more help. And then we go back and take care of that population because we have to get those who are willing and able into a safe place for them to progress and get them out of the jungle of people that we can't tell who's who until we get them in a different place. And then we go back into that area, look at what we need to do and take that piece so it will take a lot of time to get this, and we don't have all the answers, but we have a lot of questions, and we know that we want to do what's right, and we know that we have the support of the people who are providers, and we, we feel like we have a great team that's working well to do what we need to do, and the answers will come as we work through the problems. And so today I can't give you an answer about how we're going to help those who are left on the questionable line, but as I've understood it all along, we take those first, the men and the women who we can help and get them in a place where they're on, their, on the road to recovery and then go back and look at the next segment and do what we can for them. We know we're gonna need rehab, we know we're gonna need mental health and we may need 
to build facilities for those things and create the, the transportation to and from those places so that they can get the help they need. But it's surely a fact that you can't help someone who doesn't want to be helped. That was a good answer, actually. Even Thank though you. You didn't think you were giving an answer. It was an answer. Um, and so the hard part is that what you're saying, and probably the reality of this, is these first couple um, shelters that we're talking about might be our easiest shelters. Absolutely. And <laughs> Absolutely. This is, and then this the, is then going the to seem starts. like a difficult process, and yet it's really just the beginning, and we're going to dig deeper into um, more nuanced needs. Right. And, it, and it's going to open up the wound that's down there for everybody to see how bad it really is and who it is that we need to look at next. Thank you. Um, did the, going back to the St. Vinnie workshop and the three takeaways of jobs, transportation, and safety, I wondered if those were, um, if jobs were in the top three for the St. Vinnie participants too, or do I need to hold off and wait until the workshop data comes out in full form? No, so St. Vinnie's in, oh, hold on, let me pull up my notes. Thank you. From it. At St. Vinnie's, the most important one was um, being close to public transit. That was actually the number one coming out of there. And then having easy access to those services that, that, that came in second, followed by not being conducive to drug trade. Thank you. Um, I wonder, Gail, if the commission has has talked about the possibility of several much smaller sites instead of two singular sites. We have talked about smaller sites. We, we did a survey um, that answered a lot of questions about what's needed, how many beds do we need, what services should be there, and from that survey, it indicated that the 200, 250 bed, which compared to what we have now is a small um, facility, but I think we could use smaller ones if we could have concentrated effort and enough money to do it. Money is the issue. But I think we, when you get into a mental health issue, you've got people that need mental health, we don't even know how many of those there are. So to build a facility that will take care of that population, we have to know what it is be able to target something that will help them. Um, but single men and single women specifically. You're, you're asking if we should have smaller shelters for them? Yeah, or and what that more discussions farther been like. around? I think and, and I don't know about what they'd end up looking like on a map. I understand that services uh, need to be at each facility mm -hmm. and that staffing services at every single facility becomes well, yeah. I, th I personally, I think that would be ideal is to have smaller ones because they mm -hmm. would fit into neighborhoods better, they would be less conspicuous, mm -hmm. and they would not be the draw of the undesirable exactly. element. But that's not my decision. That's, um, you know, first of all, we have to have the money to do it. Second of all, we have to have the neighborhoods who are willing to house them. And third, we have to have the um, infrastructure to take care of it. And I, can I add something to, um, because what we found in these surveys and in the work we've been doing and having services easily accessible, the economies of scale really are driving um, the 200 and 250 unit because that way you can afford to put the services in the facility. If you pursue smaller, buildings for maybe 20 or 30 people um, that would require a lot of people to be hired to service those smaller facilities and you lose the economies of scale. So our funding is somewhat driving this and so is the survey and so is um, some national research that's been done as well. So I appreciate that. That's probably the driving factor as money always is in any discussion we end up having. Um, and yet, as we talked about in our meeting earlier this week, we are desperately relying on an apples to oranges scenario in what we're aiming towards. And 
even, as you said, 250 people is a lot of people in a neighborhood that doesn't currently have that kind of a, a scenario of concentration, people with needs, and um, it's a lot. And so this reliance, I understand, shifts to the county's piece of the service model and that how desperately we need clarity on how it will be different okay. and not just about the facility looking different or where we put the mats on the floor being different, but how it's going to play out on the street in the neighborhood. Mm -hmm. And I, that's not you necessarily. That's another set of wonderful people in front of us. So my last question is um, for you, Ms. Miller, again, and anybody else, Mayor, if you want to chime in, but in looking at the reality of the concentration of those critical factors that have been identified through your process, and I know that we're coming up with a map, which is so cool, but the reality of that is um, quite possible that where the uh, we're going to get the most satisfaction of our needs is geographically going to be in areas that are already uh, quite stressed or that have, um, that we'd call them neighborhoods of opportunity. If we were talking about housing, I'd call them critical communities. And how do we grapple with that geographic equity component to say, well, we need them to be close to transit and so that's within a half a mile of rail or, you know, that there's, there are some realities of what we need to serve and yet there's a reality of concentration of poverty, of, um, of other issues that we don't want to continue to concentrate in those areas. Mm -hmm. So how do you, we deal with this when that map gets in front of us and that is the probability? I think we have to look at all options. Uh, I think being close to transportation could mean many things. I think it doesn't necessarily mean being by the hub or being downtown. It means maybe you have to walk a block or two to a bus. Uh, it also could mean having vouchers. It could mean learning to use different kinds of transportation. You know, I think we have to have the ability to look differently than we ever have before. Um, I also think and hope that the education piece of this, the the um, community experience where they get to have input will help them understand that these are real people that can live in a real community. They're not people who are outcasts that need to be sequestered so nobody sees them. And I'm, I'm hoping, I'm optimistic that they will be, that 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 definition of them will be embraced so that it can be in a community where it may never have been before and it isn't just a neighborhood of opportunity but it's a neighborhood of acceptance and I know 250 people coming into a neighborhood of, of you know like Sugar House would be very difficult or wherever and I'm gonna have any inside track but um, I think education is the real issue here. People have to understand that until we decide we can accept something different, there will be nothing different. Thanks. Andrew, you looked like you were ready to pose a question before Aaron. Well, I just wanted to make sure that uh, on the, the Homeless Services Site Selection Commission, the feedback was specific to location. Um, and so when we a they asked the questions um, to the respondents, it was about location. It wasn't about services so much. So when the, the feedback comes back about safety based on, on the drug trade, it's talking about physical location, access to um, how safe it is outside the facility, those kind of things. Um, and so when we talk about the people who are using and getting services, that wasn't necessarily the question that was posed. Um, so clarifying that, and we do need to ask that question, but for this, Exercise. I don't think that was where the intent was. Um, the second piece for uh, that you brought up, Stan, and both of you actually about housing first, is not a new concept locally. I mean, this is a dozen years plus going on here where boots on the ground. This has been the de facto uh, mode of operation. Um, there's been some barriers in the way about doing that for providers, namely access to housing um, and some other things. But 
uh, as a model that's very well known um, on, on the provider network. So even if it's not coming up here, it, it's been going on. Um, so I want to be clear about that. And then I, I agree with a lot of what you're saying. Um, there's a lot of um, struggle with the parallel process of the county doing services and this commission doing site. And we talked earlier today in another meeting about um, the potential conflicts there um, and how that may, uh, it's worked in some ways and may also pose some significant challenges in our um, getting things done right in the right time frame we have. Uh, so we'd like to hear some more about that going forward, especially from the county and the commission um, where we're at because that's gonna have a huge impact on your, on your work. <laughs> and we all know that. Um, so I, I want to echo the thanks to your staff. I was at a couple of the outreach meetings, uh, very, very well done, um, well attended, and I appreciate that, all the work that we put into that, so thanks. Uh, Council, Council uh, Member Rogers, maybe um, based on the comment, we could also reach out to the county um, and ask them to come and update the council on the, uh, the service model uh, and the work that's progressing there because there is such intersect there and the importance of it happening a parallel path. Yeah, that would be great. And we, we can reach out to them or, or you're more than welcome more than, to do I'd that, be more so. than happy to. Okay. I'd be more than happy to. I, Thank I, you, Andrew. That was the same, same point I was going to make was location. It's a little crazy that we've got two different mm -hmm. entities trying to solve a problem and they have two different views of looking at it. So, But we are working together and we yes. are in contact with each other. I would just like to say one other thing about the, the uh, transportation. I mean, it may be that we need to create a system of transportation like vans that go from service to service. I don't think it's our responsibility to make sure that homeless people have transportation to everywhere they go because we don't have that. We have to make our lives work. And I think they have to learn how to do that well. But once they're in the situation where they're trying to recover, I think then it's our responsibility to help them get to where they need to do to, to be to recover. So that's another possibility. What do we do if, if we have a system of transportation between services wherever they have to go? To me, that's, that's a solution. Uh, Stan has one last question. One last question, and I know that one of the considerations that could have a really uh, pretty significant impact uh, in the neighborhoods is uh, design as a feature of, of the facilities. H has that been captured in the conversation so far? And, and how, how are we looking at that? We've seen some uh, models from other cities where they really mitigated some of the impact by really some good design around the facilities. So uh, answer that uh, in, in a couple ways. Um, so yes, that did come up during uh, the public engagement and I could, one of the actual success criteria, I always get it wrong, is the actual term for how you design facilities to, li you know, to mitigate criminal behavior, things like that. Uh, Liz can tell you the actual term. Um, there's an actual term. I'm learning all these things. It's great. Yeah, it's Graphic it's recorder, SEPTA. SEPTA, I mean, all these things. Um, I don't know what it means, but I can, <laughs> now I can say it. Um, the, other, the other piece is part of the partnership with um, uh, Salt Lake County and the collective impact in helping us move this process forward is through Collective Impact, there's a facilities programming study working group that we're uh, working very closely with the county on. And through that process, an architecture firm uh, has been uh, procured to provide the initial conceptual design work. And so that by August 15th, and this kind of is that parallel path and the need for defining the new service model, we'll, we will have beginning ideas of what this will uh, both physically look like based on services, but also uh, by providing the input that we received at the public engagement workshops, things that they will incorporate into that. So when we talk about safety, when we talk about uh, 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 mitigating queuing, you know, what would the conceptual design look like to address those issues as well? So that will be a part of that process. Well, and it occurs to me that another component of that is just how we currently provide our service at a shelter versus how we may ideally want to provide it in particular yes. uh, uh, daily access and, and the sort of removal of all the tenants and the queuing and that yes. sort of function of how we've 
uh, evolve to develop that or to, to provide that service based on volume and a lot of other factors. But that's being, that's part of that conversation as well, is yes, that, that, that we may be modifying how we deliver service yes. to the population. Absolutely. Okay. Thank you. Charlie, uh, I, I have more of a comment than a <coughs> question. Um, the workshop that I attended, uh, one of the things that we discussed, uh, or that, that was discussed, I intentionally stayed quiet because I wanted to let, I wanted to hear what everyone else had to say who was, who was attending. Um, but I think to your point, David, about uh, hiring the architectural firm to, to look at the design, design is going to be critical. Um, but design, I think, is important as well as location because one of the things that was that I heard a lot is that in order for something, especially, and and I'd like to echo my concerns about the size. I, I think 250 is is I get, you know, the economics and and why we're looking at that. But I think we need to really delve into that a little bit more, even if it has a potential of costing more, because in order to design a facility that is going to house that many people that deals with the queuing, that deals with a lot of the other issues, um, that deals with the safety of the individuals who are going to be at the shelter or the facility, whatever we want to call it, it's going to be it's going to be very, very hard to have something that will be easy to incorporate into an existing neighborhood. And I don't care where it is. I don't care. I'm, uh, you know, anytime you're moving something that is institutional in nature into an existing neighborhood where you're dealing with safety issues, you're dealing with drug issues, you're dealing with mental health issues, you're going to have to have it well lit. You're going to have to have, uh, you know, a number of things. And I think you know, if you can impart to the architects that that is one of the concerns that, that I heard, mm -hmm. you know, people are really worried about what these facilities are going to look like, how they're going to integrate into an existing neighborhood and still deal with the lighting issues, still deal with the safety issues. And honestly, I'm having a really hard time figuring out how that can happen with something that has 250 beds. I, I would like to just make a comment, and that is <clears throat> the number of people that are serviced on any given day on the YWCA campus is far larger than 200 and 250 people. So the design piece is very helpful. And um, I think if people remember that we already have facilities in this city that are successful, that service even greater numbers, um, I think that is a good selling point. And it really just comes down to management and how the program is designed. Um, the, the new resource center in Ogden, for instance, is 250 with 50 shelter beds. Um, the YWCA, uh, just the family resource center piece of it where the families can stay is 200 plus, plus they have the crisis shelter plus more. Um, you know, there is um, a lot to be said about design, but also management and how you um, determine what should be happening in the facility and what shouldn't be happening, plus what's happening outside. So yeah. management's key on this. No, and and, I, and I, I appreciate you bringing that up, Mayor, because mm -hmm. I think that the YW, what the YWCA has done with that shelter is, is truly remarkable, and I yeah. think that it does fit well within mm -hmm. the surrounding area. The difference I see is that the, that facility is a lockdown facility, you have, mm -hmm. I mean, you can't come and go like a regular, like a transitional facility will be. Mm -hmm. And I think that staffing is critical. And if, you know, as long as we have it well and, and heavily, heavily programmed, uh, which is going to be expensive um, mm -hmm. to do, that will help deal with, with some of the issues. But um, 
so I do think that it's possible, but I think siting is, is extremely important when you look at the YWCA facility. It's a multi-story uh, facility. You know, when once you leave the you know central city downtown area, um, you know, in, in Glendale Rose Park, you don't have that many multi-story facilities that that can be designed in a way right. that can handle that. So right. I, I I do appreciate that the. the uh, comparison because I think it's a good one and I think the YWCA has done a, an amazing job mm -hmm. um, but I, I I still think that we need to be very very um, conscientious about how we're looking at siting how we're looking at design and to your point mayor the programming is is Key. probably the most critical I think of any of it I would agree Thank you. so councilman I know that um, oh. No, go for, go for well, it. So I, I want to, I know in terms of time, I just want to make sure that we also have time to get you the information about uh, 500 West in Rio Grande and Sun. So I, 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 Councilman Kitchen, I think maybe had a question. Yeah, I, I did have a, a few brief questions, so I'll, I'll be quick. Um, since we're talking about design, um, I wonder how are we working with the county who's in the middle of this collective impact approach um, at realigning services, how are we working with them to design around how the services might be administered in the future? D does that make so does that question make sense? So, if we're in the process of designing with an architecture firm, are we missing something by not w having the full uh, results from the collective impact on services? I, I think that is a. I mean, that, <laughs> that's the challenge. That's the challenge that we, that we have in terms of the county really taking on that responsibility as a, as a funder of service and really realigning those services. And some of that w speaks specifically to uh, the resource centers and much broader. Um, and so I think that's also where some of the frustration may come in in terms of not having a clearer picture of what that looks like. Um, I, I think the county is doing a tremendous job in terms of moving this, moving this uh, conversation forward. And the work that they're doing now in terms of the different subcommittees looking at the, the programming uh, facilities, the housing component, the families and children programming, and then there was one other subcommittee that I'm missing, and the healthcare. Um, is really beginning that work to redesign that model. So for example, around the healthcare, and it kind of gets to Ms. Miller's point of, in terms of some of the um, creativeness about how you maybe address transportation issues as a barrier, are some of the conversations that are happening now around the healthcare providers about providing access to healthcare services in a more mobile, more collaborative fashion. And so I think those conversations that are moving the service model forward are, are, are beginning to happen and we're going to begin to see the fruit of it so we will not have a final product as far as design goes on august 15th i don't think we'll have a final product no. okay i think we'll have significant progress though and uh, just to mayor's point a moment ago about management uh, do we have an idea or is there a, an idea starting to emerge about how these facilities will be managed and programmed and what that will look like Yes, I, I think there's been a lot of interest in looking at um, the uh, Lantern House uh, and some of the programming um, model within the Lantern House uh, and some of the things that the, the Rio Grande is doing. They're doing very successfully but aren't doing enough of due to lack of resources like the rapid rehousing and really trying to uh, utilize the resource centers and, and, the, and the shelter beds as you know, quick turnaround as possible, but you need the housing on the back end to support it. So I think we have a lot of uh, successful programming that's happening. It's gonna be a matter of pulling that together and aligning both the services and the service providers in a way that they're working collaboratively. But we don't know who will manage these facilities at the There's, moment. As far as governance, there is starting to be some conversations around uh, the management of the system as well. Uh, so there is some interest uh, as, as many as, as you all know, uh, right now the Road Home, um, the Shelter the Homeless Board is a, um, is a, they own the facilities and they own the land uh, that the Road Home both in Salt Lake City and Midville sit on. 
and it, 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 it serves as a framework of some conversations about how a entity like Shelter the Homeless could be a community oversight board uh, or entity that would provide oversight both of facilities as well as programming and really holding that system together. And so we're beginning to have those conversations as well. And there are some models out there that Liz can speak to much more eloquently than I can around uh, Columbus, Ohio, and I want to say even Denver, Colorado, I believe, <laughs> maybe wrong on that one, in terms of some models for us to, uh, to be looking at as well. Okay, Erin. What you just barely said answered a piece of what I wanted to hear, but I keep hearing about Lantern House, and they're fairly new, right? Mm -hmm. They opened August of last year. Mm -hmm. So I guess I, I'm going, I, I'm setting up a tour soon, but um, I just, it, that's a very young model for us to try to be suddenly emulating when um, it, it's really young. But what I, what, I, what I would like to say to that is Lantern House itself is not new. Um, they've been around quite a while. Um, and, and they were known as St. Anne's. And it's a very similar situation where they relocated um, to another location within, with Ogden. Um, and as a part of that, really changed their service model. And, and to your point, it, it, is, um, it is a model that's evolving, and they have evolved. And I think that also speaks to what we need with the service models to recognize that we need something that's nimble and flexible, uh, that is able to learn and collect data and measure outcomes and be able to, uh, to move to improve, uh, and I think uh, Lantern House, and I want to be careful, you know, Lantern House uh, provides an opportunity to see um, a different setting, and, and, and we are looking at an opportunity to incorporate that in our next public engagement process, to actually be able to take individuals, take members of the community to the Lantern House so they can begin to understand and see what it could look like, what a different model. And I, and I say that, and, and we put Lantern House out there, not, again, as a criticism of the road home or what's happening in the Rio Grande, but to begin to envision what uh, a, a different approach may be or a different setting may look like. Thanks. Absolutely. Uh, I just have a comment. Uh, I just want to thank uh, Gail Miller and uh, the volunteers that were on that commission. Um, but I really have serious issues, too, about facilities that are 250 uh, beds, and let me give you an example of one of those, is the in-between. In-between is a facility for homeless people who are on their way out there, passing away. And we had more people come out and discuss a 25-bed facility that lies in District 2. What do you expect to happen when we're talking about 250 people in a facility in a neighborhood? And uh, to that, Mr. Chair, I think um, no matter what the size is, and um, that's why we've been engaging the community the way we have been and why we are being extremely mindful on design and service model because um, all of that matters in a neighborhood. So whether it's 25 or 250, people get upset, but part of why they're upset is because they're not well informed and they don't fully understand the service model ahead of time. I think those are key things that need to happen in order for us to be successful regardless of the size. Uh, and I'm not gonna discredit yeah. you at all. I totally agree with you, but we have a serious problem on our hands when we go out to the public and tell them this site has been selected and it is going here. Uh, I, I, I mean, we're talking 10 times the amount of people that the in-between is currently, th they can have beds for. And that is going to be a serious problem. And actually, Mr. Chair, if I might, a, a big piece of the theme we were hearing from the neighbors proximal to the in-between um, was really about numbers of people, how many people are coming mm -hmm. out to smoke, and that they're smoking mm -hmm. kind of 24 hours a day. Some, would, some people are congregating, and it's wafting into my backyard, or I don't feel mm -hmm. comfortable having my kids go out in the front or in the back to play, um, and size does matter on those kind of issues and mm -hmm. that that ended up being the bulk oh, yeah. of what we heard so not that there's an answer for that right now but oh, yeah. certainly part of the the design process of the building is a piece of that but you can only design your way into so much comfort 
uh, before you have a reality of uh, 250 right. people. You know, as elected officials, I think we all have to realize that we have to have the courage to face the harsh realities that we are addressing today and the realities of changing those harsh realities so we have a better future to look forward to. And that's not easy as elected officials, and I get that, but it is our task. And if we do this together, um, and we are as thoughtful as we have been so far, I think we will drive a much greater success. Great, thanks again for everybody that's been involved. Could we maybe take two minutes and just have Liz uh, provide you the quick laundry two list of things? Two minutes. I'll try to do it in 90 seconds. Great. So <laughs> the police started their foot patrol last week. They're doing afternoon and evening shifts down on 500 West, 300 South area. The new portable restrooms that council funded, they are being delivered and in, put into place this week and next. The first location is going to be at the northwest corner of 500 West and 400 South. We have 100 new bins that have been delivered to a place for your stuff, thanks to public services. We're going to do, um, we're going to put those in place and start accepting new clients starting next week for that. Um, we also, some smaller things that we're doing but are very important to improving 500 West, we're actually removing um, a lot of the rocks and the park strips of 500 West that unfortunately have become weapons. We are also partnering with the county health department with their cleanups. The uh, county health department, they are out there in that neighborhood a lot, but unfortunately they have um, small equipment so they can't haul a lot of trash away at one time. So we're partnering with them with our sanitation truck so we can haul away more stuff at a single time. Also, just some things that are coming in the near future, as in the next two to three weeks. We're installing attendants at, Port at the Portland Loos to make them safer. We're bringing in additional trash cans on 500 West so there won't be as much debris on the street. We're adding the extra clean team shifts, and we're also looking at additional street lighting. Uh, just one more thing that's happening is we're also, we're working with the road home to move the queuing inside the playground area. So that should be happening within the next month. So just to, I see the look on your face. So just to clarify, so this is the playground area that's not being used. Um, and, Sorry. What, yeah. and, and, what we're, <laughs> and what we're providing is some funding for the fencing around the playground itself so it doesn't get hurt. Right. Sorry. Should have clarified that. Yeah. Derek, you're good? Okay. Hey, good, quick, quick. good 90 seconds, except for Charlie. Except for me. So, and I, I'll, I'll be even quicker. Um, with the attendance at the Portland Loos, uh, you're also planning on having attendance at the other uh, yes. portable restrooms, correct? Will all okay. be controlled by us and Great. not dealers. Great. Thank and we're, we're passing up a sign-up sheet for you all to volunteer. <laughs> to <laughs> I will, for real. And yeah. we, in, in all, in all right. seriousness, we are, we, what we're doing is we're fencing off the Portland Loos so that we can control that access mm -hmm. to the who, who are you going to have do that? We're going to start with the clean team. Okay, yeah. great. Thank you. Okay, uh, we are, we're going to go on to item number 10, and I just want to thank, again, Gail Miller for being, being here and the crew that you all participated in with. It was great thank outreach you. for for our community in Salt Lake City. Thank you for your support of what we're doing. We appreciate it. Um, and I would like to thank Dr. Alexa Cunningham, who has been with us for 43 minutes, waiting graciously uh, to come and talk to us about uh, her new position as the superintendent of Salt Lake City School District. Good evening, um, Mr. Chairman, members of the City Council. Thank you so much for having me here this evening. I'm very honored to um, be invited to address you and have a conversation about the wonderful things that are going on in the Salt Lake City School District. And I'm sorry I to interrupt you. Would you mind pulling the microphone a little bit closer to you? Better? Yes, thank okay. you. Okay. Thank you again. I'd also like to thank um, Mrs. Bennett, our governing board president, for being with us this evening. Um, the support of the city council is paramount to the success that we are to have in the Salt Lake City School District. And I'd like to continue our working relationship so that we can make sure that all of our students receive um, a quality education. Schools are vital to the success of any community and especially to this community and the support of this community has just been wonderful since my arrival a few weeks ago. 
Um, our focus in the coming years is going to be on teaching and learning and ensuring that all of our students are successful in their, their classes and in their schools. We want to work on building community partners and enhancing the community partners that we have already. We also want to celebrate our successes and we are going to do all that we can to tell our story. There are a lot of good things going on in the Salt Lake City School District and we want to highlight those um, those stories so that our community will know that there are great teachers and wonderful students in all of our schools. We are going to ask our teachers to continue to engage in rigorous instruction for all students and make sure that all students are receiving a quality education. We will actively recruit and work on retaining highly quality teachers so that our schools be will become known across the state as having the best teachers possible. And we will continue to work on activities for all students in extracurricular, music, arts, athletics, clubs, different activities, because we know that students who are engaged in these types of activities always do better in, in school. My hope is that we will continue to, to work together and that our leadership teams will continue to have the meetings that they are, have had. And I would like to invite each one of you to visit our schools and go on a walk with me and visit classrooms so that you can see the wonderful things that are taking place each day in each of our schools. I know that our administrators, our teachers, and our students would love to see you in our classes. And I'm, I stand ready to answer any questions um, that you may have. Thank you very much. Council members, any questions? Andrew. Can you talk a little bit about, well, welcome, number one, I'm sorry. Don't cry, Dan. Um, I, I represent the west side of Salt Lake, mm -hmm. and uh, Michael Clare is our, our current board member, and he's brought up a lot of concerns in the past about diversity issues, mm -hmm. uh, one of which happened fairly recently about a reassigning of some staff in the office. Can you talk a little bit about that? Or? Mm -hmm. Um, we are, are committed to um, diversity, and I know that I have a big job ahead of me in making sure that our campuses are, are diverse. So we have made sure that we have um, quality staff in the district office. We have had um, a reassignment of a staff member, and that staff member has been charged this year with creating equity plans for each of our schools. We will start at the beginning of the year, and our goal will be to have equity plans in place at each of our schools by May of 2017. We'd like those plans to address not only academics, but also a social aspect of equity. We know that we have a training component and we have um, charged our leadership to look for training opportunities for our teachers, our administrators, and our students that relate to equity and diversity. And we also would like to engage our students in this conversation and so we are looking for different types of organizations that we could join that might enhance the experience our students are having in all of our, our schools. So it is a conversation that all members of our leadership team are participating in and we are going to work to um, meet the expectations of our governing board when it comes to equity and diversity. Thank you for that. You're welcome. Welcome to Salt Lake City. Thank you. I'm an Arizona native myself, <laughs> but I like it here so much better. I do too. I hope you do too. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm wondering what type of unique collaboration between city and school district um, you might, if you could, if you could just imagine with me for a second, and I'm putting you on the spot a little bit, mm -hmm. but we certainly have achievement gaps here in our city, in mm -hmm. our school district, as um, diverse cities all over the country do. We have equity issues in our city in almost every facet of everything we do, mm -hmm. and we are working hard at addressing those as a city entity. So uh, I, I know that you as a school district are doing the same in your own regards. Can you imagine ways that we might be able to actually work together to address those issues for our students? Um, because we know that access to opportunity mm -hmm. is, a, is a broad and, and sometimes vague term that truly translates to a trajectory of lifetime opportunity mm -hmm. that starts young. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that we have, we have some possibility between our organizations to uh, do better mm -hmm. for our students and that there is, um, there's an individual lifetime impact all the way to a citywide economic impact when we talk about offering a better education mm -hmm. to Salt Lake City students. So do you have any ideas about ways that we can work together in the future on the achievement gap? 
I think that um, we can start by engaging our students in part of these conversations and helping our students to become actively engaged in the process of school, the process of the city that li they live in and the state, and looking for opportunities where we might have our students at a, a city council meeting, or we may have a, a city council member meeting with a small group of students talking about what um, has led you all to choose a life of service and hopefully encouraging our students to do that. I think having you actively participate or come and, and speak at our, one of our governing board meetings or speak at one of our schools, at our um, community councils, I think that would be another way that we could engage in this process. And I believe that when we talk about diversity and equity, we can continue to share and tell, like I said, tell our story so that more and more people know that the work that we're doing in our schools will impact all of our students. I think that the more that we can work on our graduation rate and enhance the things that we are doing for our students, the better that is not only for our school district but for our community because we are graduating more and more students who will be college and career ready and will hopefully choose to stay in Salt Lake City and become contributing members of this um, city and this state. Those are good answers on the fly. Thank you. Um, I wrote down three mm -hmm. particularly. Um, I would be, I would love to plug in and do some whatever kind of speaking opportunities from classrooms to your board or whatever you could see. Um, I hope we have seven open doors on that. I don't know about your schedules. I'm busy, but this would be something I'm interested in. Um, and I think mentorship becomes a, a natural next step for some of those uh, engagement opportunities that, that naturally occurs mm -hmm. um, and one way that I see that happening here is in our own internships that we have in our office here at the council we have some fabulous high school interns some year-round but mostly during the summer and um, if you don't know about that program we I would love to offer someone from our staff to make that connection and, and perhaps that's something we can even enhance in some way and then the graduation rate um, there's some interesting case studies of uh, around the country of, of things like Southwire uh, mm -hmm. in the South. I don't know if you know about that company and where they looked at graduation rates uh, declining rapidly and they found a way for that business to benefit also and, mm -hmm. and increase those. But it's hard to just go ahead and replicate something mm -hmm. like that. But perhaps a role that the city could take, a bigger role that we could take is in our, our own connections as a city entity with the business community in facilitating a dialogue, if only to begin with, in ways that we can uh, approach that graduation rate and reach students who are in a critical position about whether or not they're going to continue with their education or drop out of high school. I think that there may be some opportunity that I can't even imagine, but that the, the business minds in this city could. So I hope that this will be the beginning of a conversation and um, know that I'm open to helping in whatever ways you, you might need. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Great questions, Aaron. And uh, welcome, Dr. Cunningham. Thank you. Thanks for being here. Um, I would like to say that my door is always open as well for that offer that Aaron put out there. and. Um, you know, this is more of a statement, a uh, comment. Uh, before I became a member of the city council um, a few years back, um, my role, my job was to uh, work with second and third grade uh, students at Lincoln Elementary, which is currently under construction with their new building. Mm -hmm. And I think it will soon be known as Liberty Elementary, if I'm not mistaken. But uh, that was a very formidable time in my early adult life. and. Um, I just value that experience quite a bit, and I'd love to get back into the school as much as possible, any school really. Uh, but one thing that was really um, special to me was, uh, you know, during my time there, is we rolled out this community garden um, at Lincoln Elementary. And um, something that's really important to me, and maybe something that we can work on, um, you know, with your board and the city council, is uh, access to healthy, fresh, healthy local food and a way that we can really look at the long-term impact of school, that the school has um, in the life of, of, its, of the student. And for me, you know, public health is, is of the utmost importance. And 
you know, incubating healthy habits and healthy choices in the, in the students is really important. And so I don't know if you have anything to say on that topic, but um, I'd love to be involved uh, as much as I can. I would like to comment. I was at um, two of our schools today. It was actually two schools that had community gardens, and it was nice to see that even though we're, it's summer vacation, we still have students returning to the schools, working on the gardens in the summer with their teachers, and their teachers and the schools are really trying to, to foster that, that healthy living, that sustainability. So I think that that could be something that we could, could work on together and even involve our food and nutrition department in that too in the work that they're doing to feed our students not only during the year but also during the summer. It's a great project. Uh, Dr. Cunningham, welcome Thank to you. Salt Lake City. Um, I, I just want to mention that you know we do have, the Salt Lake City Council uh, does have a strong work history with uh, mm -hmm. not only the school board but the Salt Lake City School District a few years ago had uh, a wonderful opportunity of, of moving forward the Salt Lake City uh, anti-bullying initiative, working very closely mm -hmm. with uh, board chair uh, Bennett mm -hmm. uh, at that time and, and moving that. And it's been, it was a great opportunity, I think, to, uh, for the city to work closely with the district um, and direct schools. And so um, I, I hope that you will view all of us uh, and but the, but the council as a whole as well as a resource. Uh, if there's anything that we can help uh, move, as, as you move your goals forward, um, I am more than happy to do uh, whatever I can, as, as most of my other colleagues have stated. Thank you. Thank you, Charlie. Uh, Dr. Cunningham, I'm gonna go one step further and have my crew get with your crew and then we'll set something up immediately because I really would like to go around District 1 with you and and take a look at some of the, the areas and talk about some ideas that we've got. I would love to do that. I've been, um, since I've been here, I think this is my second week, I've had the opportunity to start visiting all of our schools and you all would be so proud of the work that is going on and please know that, that the children that are in your districts are being well cared for and well educated in our schools and we will continue to, to work to, to get better so that we can provide all of our students with that quality education. Thank you so much for being here and especially Thank on short you. notice we we really appreciate you. Oh, it is such an honor to, to be here and to hear the support that we have. I really do appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. We're going to move on to item, I know we're a little bit behind, but we're going to move on to item number 11, the franchise agreement and clean energy uh, cooperative agreement with Rocky Mountain Power. All of us have had the opportunity to meet with, I'm pretty sure, with Vicki Bennett uh, from our, she is our director of sustainability and Ben Ludke from Council Policy Analyst. So, Vicki, introduce Great. us, let us know what's going on. Great, thank you very much. Um, I will just do brief introduction. As you're all aware, our franchise agreement with Rocky Mountain Power has expired and we are in the process of renegotiating it and using this as an opportunity to build in our clean energy goals based on the resolution, thank you, that we passed last week. So I'm actually going to turn this over to Tyler Polson, who's our energy program manager, to give a short update as to where we are. And as Vicki mentioned, I wanna keep it short so we have the majority of time for, for questions and comments, but start by acknowledging Allen Bentley from Rocky Mountain Power, who's our community account manager. And she's here and she's been great and tireless in her efforts. and being very communicative with, and with Aline, the And would you please come, so. come up too, since you're here representing Rocky Mountain Power and any questions we have, we can ask you on the spot. Thank you for being here. So as was mentioned in, in the transmittal document in the council packet, the franchise agreement did expire. And as part of that, the city and Rocky Mountain Power started discussing what were this, the city's energy goals in terms of clean energy, renewable energy, uh, electric vehicles, energy efficiency, those sorts of things. And the transmittal summarizes, in essence, what we hope to capture in a statement of cooperation that would precede the franchise agreement. And within that statement, it would articulate a number of things in terms of the city and the, the company, RMP, working together in good faith um, in terms of devising and, and creating new pathways for renewable energy for our community, working together when it comes to the Public Service Commission. They'll still be regulating the company as well as activities that occur by the company but working together in good faith to, to take proposals to the commission. And um, also, the, the cooperative statement will be referencing the 100% renewable by 2032, the, the really foundational goal as part of the resolution last week. 
And so with that, I just very quickly wanted to talk about uh, the logistics of all of this and, and what's in motion here. So I mentioned the, the cooperative statement or statement of cooperation, and we can circulate some draft language that's been approved by both the city and Rocky Mount Power as, as recently as late last week. This, this language needs to go through um, an additional review by, by internal city attorney's office, and they'll add, add information there and then a, a signature line for the mayor and, and the CEO of Rocky Mountain Power. But the idea will be that that cooperation statement will be approved and adopted, and that will catalyze the franchise agreement coming to the council for formal consideration in, in its ordinance form. Uh, after the, the cooperation statement, the next thing would be an implementation plan that would be prepared and that we've, we've referenced a target of March 31st, 2017 in terms of in more detail de detailing the roles and, and the types of things that we'll be pursuing. It won't have everything in it. The whole process will be iterative throughout the duration, but this will have some more concrete ideas about the role of the city versus the company and, and next possible steps. And then also within within the statement of cooperation, uh, and it'll it'll reference an annual report that would first be published in spring 2018 and be followed every year thereafter, and that would be a formal public document that would update council and everyone else in terms of where where the city and the company are at. And so with that, wanted to turn it over to council for any questions or, or comments. Questions, council members? Statements? Okay, Aaron. I'll be open it up like that. Uh, well done. It's not done. But this is the most progressive conversation in this regard, I think, in the country right now. Um, I'm, I'm just, I'm beside myself with excitement about this. And, Aline, I wonder if you have any thoughts on this unique process and how Rocky Mountain Power got to this point with us um, when I think it frankly feels like when I was a gender studies major a long time ago, over a decade ago, if someone would have said, guess what, gay marriage is going to be legal in Utah in 10 years, I would have said, whatever, there is no way that's not going to happen. And here we are. And frankly, that's kind of what this feels like. That if 10 years ago, I never would have believed that we would be at this table with Rocky Mountain Power with these kind of progressive goals leading the country. How did we get here? one step at a time. But I, I will say I, I'm proud that, um, that we have been able to work so cooperatively together. But I also want to point out, and some of you have heard this before, our company began a transition to renewable energy some time ago. We were the first company outside of California to develop a geothermal resource um, in Beaver County. <clears throat> and that began in 1984. We upgraded that in, I think, 2007. In the last 10 years, we've invested over a billion dollars in wind energy. Uh, Rocky Mountain Powerwell Pacific Corp., our parent company, is the second largest regulated utility owner of wind in the United States. Our sister utility in the Midwest, Midwest uh, Mid-American Energy, is number one. So we have a strong commitment to renewable energy. We launched our subscriber solar uh, project in Miller County in, uh, in April. That's a 20 megawatt project. And we are so pleased that Salt Lake City stepped up to take 15% of that project with a three megawatt commitment. So uh, we have been moving towards more, more renewables. Uh, no doubt this is a very, very ambitious plan. But just as we reached agreement here that we would commit to do this, we are also committed to achieving those goals. And we look forward to working with you. Thank you. Uh, it's exciting. And there's only about four steps to us seeing an annual report. It makes it seem really plausible that we're almost there. Um, I know it's a lot of work between here and there. I want to thank all of you for the work you're doing. This is true leadership. Thank you for doing this, and I hope that our resolution made it fairly clear what our expectations are of the process or the results of it. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Stan? I'm not sure it's exactly like gay marriage. Um, 
<laughs> but I appreciate the sentiment <laughs> that, that we, no one could imagine we'd actually be here. So <laughs> in that respect, yes, I absolutely agree. Um, I uh, also just want to um, share my appreciation for the effort so far. I do, I do think um, it's uh, nothing short of miraculous that we are where we are right now, and uh, it's incredibly encouraging. So um, I hope that, that uh, Aline, in particular, uh, Rocky Mountain Power is aware of the amazing sort of broad-based support that the city uh, residents are, are showing in regards to our recent resolution and work and the direction um, that certainly you're going as part of this agreement. I think there's a, a really um, strong movement of support um, uh, for this type of initiative. So I'm very encouraged to, to see us working in that direction. So thank you all. Great. Thank you, everyone, for being here. All the effort that's gone into this. I know it's not signed yet, so let's get some signatures on that. We will do so. Thank you. <laughs> we are uh, on to item number 12 that we will be bumping. So we're going to jump to uh, number 13, which is a board appointment for the Housing Trust Fund Advisory Board with David Smoot. Welcome, David. If you'll speak into the microphone, uh, give us a quick little background. Tell us why you're uh, willing to serve on the Housing Trust Fund Advisory Board, and we'll open it up to questions. Certainly. Uh, thank you for the opportunity. Again, my name is David Smoot. I'm a resident of District 6. I am uh, an attorney, a banker, a almost 30-year resident of Salt Lake City. I have family members uh, who have a need for, who would benefit, rather, from affordable housing and some of the uh, issues that are addressed here through the, through the uh, Housing Advisory Board. Uh, I have had a professional experience with individuals uh, significantly through the bankruptcy process, through subprime mortgages and housing issues as those have arisen in the uh, financial crisis here in the country, not only locally but nationally. Uh, I currently work uh, in the banking industry uh, in a non-legal capacity, yet I'm trained as a lawyer and now working in a managerial process. Just have an interest in the issues of everybody needs a leg out. And this is a good way to do it. Question. Anyone have any questions? Thank you for your willingness to stand. I do, but I'm not sure it's specifically related to the Housing Trust Fund Advisory Board. But there is some concern expressed, I think, locally and nationally that, that we may be seeing a very similar sort of bubble in the housing market that we saw 2007, 2008. I mean, what's your sense of that? Are we treading on thin ice again? I don't have a crystal ball. I, I appreciate that. Uh, but. I don't, watching prices in residential housing are going up. Salt Lake City has, a, some would say, an inordinate amount of high-priced housing right now in the Central District, particularly Central City. And our express, you would hear in just casual conversations, concern over that being overbuilt. You hear the inability of uh, individuals to buy first, uh, first time buyers to enter the market, notwithstanding historically low interest rates. Uh, so uh, ingredients are there. Whether it bakes a cake, I don't know. <laughs> I appreciate it. Thank you so much uh, for your willingness and time uh, to serve on this really important advisory body for the city. Thank you. Okay. Especially because this is housing is a council priority this year. And Understood. Yeah, we, we appreciate your willingness to serve. You'll be on the, con I think, on the consent agenda. Yes, you'll be on the consent agenda. You, you don't have to be there, but feel free to stay if you'd like and listen to people and well, speak their mind. Unfortunately, I have another commitment I have to run to right now. So. Thank you for being here. Thank you all. Thank uh, you. We're moving on to the board appointment of District 1's own Courtney Reeser uh, for the Transportation Advisory Board. And Courtney actually goes by Corky. So yes, I do. All right, you weren't here for the beginning. Tell us why you're interested in serving on the Transportation Board. Well, um, I've been a lifelong resident of Salt Lake City and um, living on the west side, I know that we have uh, a real need to have a, a strong voice on, in District 1 to help represent what we need to have for the future. And also, I'm very familiar with the city and I'm more than willing to compromise when it comes to, you know, balancing the needs for around the areas. Any questions for Corky? Erin looked like she was. Sure. Um, 
Yes, I'll, I'll, I was going to ask what your opinion is on your it, neighborhood's most, uh, the, your highest need for alternative transportation. Our highest need is to actually have more bus service and mass transit and connections to other uh, track stations and that sort of thing. Uh, right now, Rose Park only has one route that goes both ways. So it counterclockwise itself. And it does not go to any track stations. It just goes right to West High and back. So um, such as myself, I, I work at the University of Utah. And it would take me over an hour to get from my house to the university. And uh, if we had better access to mass transit, then I could probably make that trip in 40 minutes. Hi, Mary. Hi, just coming up to support my oh, people. Okay. <laughs> well, I, I hope that you're excited. We're excited to see our transit master plan. Yes, that I've, be I've been re looking at it, and, and I was um, able to go to the meeting this month, and it was very informative, so. Well, thank you for being willing to volunteer. It's um, a generous commitment to make, and this is a really exciting time to be a part of this discussion. It is, it is, I'm very excited. Thank you. So, thank you. Thank you, Corky, for representing District One. I have all the faith in the world with you. You already fulfill everything that you put yourself out there for, so thank you. Thank you, James. You'll be on the consent agenda. You can feel free to stay and listen to the long meeting in the formal session, but you will be on the consent agenda. Wonderful, I appreciate it, yeah. thank you. Thank you. Board appointment for the Public Utilities Advisory Committee. This gentleman needs no introduction. He is the former mayor of Salt Lake City, Chris Smart. You need to let him go. He's on his way up. <laughs> Come on up, former mayor. <laughs> I did. I said Ted Wilson. Former. Oh, did I? I thought, former mayor. Former mayor Ted Wilson. Thank that you ought for to being disqualify here. me from the get-go, I think. I w I'm not going <laughs> to say the old and the new because we're not going to distinguish which is we'll which. Just say the honorable. <laughs> well, I think you know me mostly, and it's nice to meet you, uh, Councilmember Johnson. Terrific. I think I met you when you were sworn in that day. So, I want to thank the mayor for her trust and putting me on the Public Utilities Advisory Board with your consent. Um, I think, you know, I'm sort of known around the city because Dee Dee Cordini and Rocky Anderson were the Olympic mayors. I was known as the sewer mayor because I think the most important thing I was able to do in those years was to restore the sewer. And it's basically pretty much the same one with some good adjustments over time. And I'd like to see that sewer um, be wonderful. <laughs> and I worry about it because I think the state might want to tab us with the bill as we extend that service. That might also affect our water lines. Uh, and we need a firm pledge from the state of Utah that whatever this, the prison costs, it will be compensated. And I think in the sense of the Public Utilities Advisory Board, we can give some strength to any of those recommendations. Uh, I think a board like this can speak in technical terms. I'm not technically oriented myself, but I do know that Laura has a wonderful ability to be technical and her board as a citizen board can support her. I'm not suggesting we run around and lobby separately from this great council, but I do think that we need strength there, and if I can add some, I'd love to. Uh, I'm very concerned about the algae situation. I know utilities is concerned. Uh, Laura just told me the algae's gone downstream, and uh, I think those kinds of things need to be talked about in an advisory way. What you tell the public at this point, how you warn them, whatever it might be, uh, these things are a matter of safety, and they're very important. But I'm thrilled to be here, and uh, I'd love to work with the mayor and 
and Lar Briefer and uh, what I think is an excellent department and it always has been. So before Stan goes, I'm just gonna say there are a lot of projects in regards to this board appointment that are going on in District 1 and it's coming full circle, you know, again with a new uh, sewer treatment plant and being involved with that is is key. So we appreciate your willingness to serve on that. Yeah, thank you. Stan. Yeah. And Mayor, Stan. I can't. I don't think in all my time here I've heard of a better qualification for the Public Utilities uh, Board than worrying about the sewer. Um, <laughs> and so if you're worried about the sewer, uh, I, I have a great level of comfort in your investment in, <laughs> in serving on this board. So thank you very much. Thank you. Good. Aaron. Oh, Ted, any excuse we can have to bring you into this building again is a pleasure of mine. I like that you're known as the sewer mayor. Um, I once had Rocky Anderson in the hallway and asked, I was talking to him about the portraits in the hall, and he said, well, you know, Ted stops at the knees because his pants were rolled up still from the flood. Uh, so you'll have to walk out and check out Mayor Wilson's portrait. It, you'll have to tell us later if that's true, that you still had your floods on. Um, and also, I've never seen this whole room smile at the same time, and you just pulled that off. So congratulations <laughs> to you on that one. Thank uh, you. We're lucky to have you serving in this capacity, and uh, uh, I'm glad that you're thinking about the possible scenarios with the prison expansion. And Laura would love probably for me to stop talking about urban waste heat recovery, uh, but we've got, a, I'm gonna say it one more time because I've got the mic, we've got thousands of people moving in at the same time in the Northwest Quadrant, and they're mm. gonna start pooping on day one. We're gonna have a great big sewer main that is yeah. seeping heat out, and we have a chance because there is not a pipe in the ground to design a system that captures that heat and turns it into energy. And if the prison wants it, then they can have a serious discount on their energy needs there. And if sure. they don't, then it becomes an incentive for our eco-district and the economic development that will surely come with that expansion out there. Sure. So I just had to make the plug for, for capturing the heat from the poop that's gonna start on day one when people move that's into that's the prison. That's great, and you know, uh, I think the department has a lot to do with energy efficiency too. Uh, how you deliver these services and put them together is very important. And my professional work now, I'm still working. I'm run you care. And I've worked very closely with Vicki Bennett and uh, with the mayor. Uh, I think our mayor is extremely well, I mean, really committed to clean air. I think the stuff you talked about tonight, the stuff you announced this week on the energy policy is first class. And uh, Fun to be around you guys. I think you're doing a lot of good things. Thanks. Well, Mayor, I know that you haven't been to enough council formal meetings across the hall, so feel free to stay <laughs> and have another one in your belt, but you're on okay. the consent agenda for this evening. Thank you very much. We appreciate you being here. Appreciate and it. To Thank serve. you. Good. Uh, is Jenna Hayworth here? Jen Hayworth. Jan, come on up. And you are looking to be appointed to the Art Design Board. I don't know if you were here. Give us a reason why. Tell us why you're interested in serving on this board. Um, well, I'm very keen to follow the uh, development of the cultural core. I work at the Leonardo, um, and we're embedded in the idea of art design and technology uh, and science. And I think the, the crossover between the different arts and the, the functions of uh, culture in this city are really vibrant at the moment. And uh, I'm really looking forward to um, being a part of that if that is passed. I think that, uh, you know, that Salt Lake is on the cusp of a huge development um, in terms of cultural um, ideas and uh, newness. And we still have a lot of sites that would take good art um, inclusions. I've been involved in those projects through the Downtown Alliance and uh, working with uh, different people uh, in the city to. Um, create murals and uh, that sort of thing. We're presently working on a big mural project that will be a traveling exhibit that we're excited about over at the Leonardo. So that sort of thing has been the place I've been, you know, both in the UK and here. I worked on the Crafts Council in the UK um, for uh, three years and uh, that was distributing funds and ideas through architecture and uh, installations and so forth across London. Um, well, actually it was 
it was the whole United Kingdom, it was Wales and uh, Scotland and Ireland and England. So yeah, I'd, I'd love to serve. <laughs> Questions for Jan. Thank you so much, Jan. Like I said, you've heard it already. You'll be on the consent agenda across the hall. If you Thank want to you. experience a formal meeting in the, with the council, feel free to join us. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, we have another board appointment for Parks, Trail, uh, Parks, Natural Lands, Trails, and Urban Forestry, Elliot Mott. Come on up, Mr. Mott, and tell us why you would be willing to serve on this board. Thank you for this time, uh, Mayor, Council. I appreciate uh, the opportunity to participate in the, uh, the Open Space Trails and Parks program in Salt Lake City. I reason that if uh, uh, this is life elevated, then uh, certainly our landscape is an important component of that. And how communities treat their open space, their parks, their trails, facilitates active lifestyles if we choose to do so. Uh, I think of New York City, what would it be without Central Park? What would Dublin be without Phoenix Park? What would Denver be without the South Platte River? Uh, those opportunities uh, that this community has to uh, uh, augment uh, our lifestyles and improve them in important and significant ways. I, leave a, I live an active lifestyle, and uh, I would like to be part of that process here in the community. Okay. Thanks for being willing to serve. We had a pretty exciting discussion earlier today. Well, maybe it wasn't that exciting, actually, but that talked about money, and money's exciting, especially when it's about parks. And this is in relation to our impact fee discussion that is kind of, it was a 101 today, it was the beginning of what will be an ongoing discussion. But the, the bottom line is that there, um, that we capture money from new developments in our city that must be used to maintain the current level of service to our residents. So just because there's more people doesn't mean you can have a more limited access to parks. And so parks get to benefit 100% from that fund, meaning that we can buy new parks lands and pay for it uh, completely from this, this fund of impact fee money. And I'm getting into the weeds too much, but I want you to walk into those meetings and that conversation thinking about the fact that we have impact fee dollars that are sitting there, that we need to spend, that we can uh, maintain our level of service in our growing population here in our city by increasing parks. And that's exciting because it's not many. I mean, Ted's got to work with poop and no extra money, basically. I mean, utilities is part of impact fees, but only to a certain degree, while parks is 100%. So you get green space and kids on, on swing sets and money, while Mayor Wilson doesn't get any of that. So take advantage of these benefits that are coming with the, the position that you're going to be a part of. I just have to add that you also get dogs and poop. So um, there's poop in everything we do. It is a, it is a component. Uh, yes, it is part of everything we do. So <laughs> including <laughs> parks. <laughs> I stand corrected. Thanks for being willing to volunteer. You're welcome. Thank you for this opportunity. And I'm going to extend the same offer. You want to join us at the formal meeting? Feel free, but you're on the consent agenda. Okay. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. And is Steve Eckland here. We're three minutes, two minutes ahead of schedule for oh, Steve. He might be in the hallway. Hang on. And while Mr. Mott was talking about all these fantastic parks in the area, what would they be like without them? What would Rose Park be without the Rose Park Golf Course? Right, Courtney? That's right. Well, he's wearing his white coat. Well, I'm smelling ice cream out there. <laughs> are you Stephen? I am, sir. Stephen Eklund, please come up. You are looking to be appointed to the Golf Ad uh, Enterprise Fund Advisory Board. I would expect you to wear a green jacket, not a white one. Well, I've got green here. Okay. And blue and red. And, you know, I mean. I was thinking for the uh, championship, the Masters, the green coat. I would love to wear one of those. Mm -hmm. I'd like to earn one too, but I don't <laughs> think it's in my lifetime. <laughs> Tell us, tell us a little bit about you, Stephen, and why you would uh, be willing to serve on this board. Well, I think golf plays a very important role in the lives of many people, but beyond that, 
it's a perfect way to enhance open space, and I think it's environmentally should be environmentally friendly. Um, I think that I've been golfing since 1979, and I, during the last few years, I haven't been able to get out as often as I'd like to. Um, but I'm ready to take it with a vengeance since now I'm retired, and uh, we can go for it then. Uh, you know, I guess to sum up my feelings about it, it, it would be we've got six great courses, and they cater to different types of golfers. I was here a year ago when the proverbial mess hit the fan, okay? There was an awful lot of meetings and studies and all that other stuff, and I think we came, to, came through that pretty well. I had the chance to, to offer a comment back then. But th this isn't necessarily just about me. It's, it's my desire to serve the public. And I was in a job where service was very important. Uh, the 35 years that I was an administrative law judge for the state of Utah, I took a lot of that with me. And uh, I think I would give this my all. Um, it would be top priority in my life, uh, next to my wife, of course. And uh, I would like to take the opportunity to give back to Salt Lake what Salt Lake's given to me. Tom. Thank you, Charlie. Mr. Agilman, thank you very much for your willingness to serve on this board. Um, it's a, as you know from uh, your participation uh, during our, our discussions uh, and, and work a couple of years ago, um, we still have a number of problems with golf and the, and the, the feasibility uh, overall of the entire board. And so I, I do appreciate your willingness. I think that as a council, um, you know, we, we have spent a lot of time uh, and effort looking into how we can make our courses um, viable uh, for not just now, but also for the future. Uh, your willingness to not only serve on this board, but to commit uh, the time that you've talked about, I think is, is exactly what uh, what we need at this point, especially as we're looking uh, to how best to keep these courses viable. So thank you for your willingness. Absolutely. Any other questions for Mr. Eklund? Gee, is okay. that a good sign? That's a great sign. You can feel free to join us across the hall where you'll be on the consent agenda. Or you I'll be able to stay for a bit. I've got tickets up to Red Butte to see Boss Skaggs tonight. Well, so that sounds a lot better than sitting off. across the hall. <laughs> You're on consent. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> now, the mayor, she's not on consent. So. Yeah, and I don't have understand. tickets, so I'll be there for I you. Thank you so much for being here. We appreciate your willingness to serve. Well, I want to thank the, the council for meeting with me. It matters a lot to me to be able to meet you all in your official capacity. and. Uh, you know, at the risk of sounding a little bold, if you were to recommend that I take the position and I get it, I would, I would, you'd be making a good choice because I'm ready to give, I'm ready to give what I can. Well, that sounds great. We appreciate that. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you oh, yes. Take care. And that concludes our work session meeting. Dinner is, we don't have any announcements, I don't think. Dinner is served on the liaison's table, so feel free.